We are live. Take it away, Brian. Yeah, good morning, Living Soil Nerds. Happy Thursday to you. Uh, shout out to my co-host, Layton, and as always, uh, kind of a salute for the whole industry to Peter uh, for continuing to build this educational platform. I feel like because of some of this, there's a lot more people that I have now have access to uh, and just learning about. And in just a few months, I feel like Jet House Gardens, Chandler, uh, has really kind of uh, piqued the eye of a lot of people, I feel like, in our industry. So I'm I'm really excited to be able to pick your brain today, Chandler. I know that um, there's a lot of things that uh, you and I see eye to eye on a lot of stuff, especially when it comes to vermicomposting and, and just the way that things are kind of done. Um, so I'm excited to learn even more about that because you are definitely at the you know, you're, you're definitely at an advanced level with doing this as a business. You know, for me, it was just more of like a hobby and starting to notice a few things. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I'm excited uh, to really pick your brain because you're doing this on the, on the commercial level as well. Uh, so there's a lot of things I know we're going to talk about today. I know Layton's going to be able to uh, really pick your brain on, on a level that I always wish I, I could, but uh, just not there, I feel like, uh, genetically. Uh, so that's a, the exciting part of this show is that we're really able to dive deep with... Uh, with certain things and certain aspects where we can all kind of rewind this later on and, and really, yeah. you know, uh, kind of digest a lot of the conversations that we're going to have today. I know that you're um, like the living soil director of Wormies. Uh, so yeah. I kind of wanted to start there because I know that, you know, at least for, for myself and like my family and stuff over here, we're really diving deeper into water and then how that water is even affecting our compost, our vermicompost and kind of taking that to the next level. Oh yeah. Um, the beauty of using vermicompost in my opinion, is that especially when you're first getting started into this, it's really hard to kind of mess that up because you're allowing the worms to take hold. Again, it's more about, especially with living soil systems, soil food web ideology, uh, we're more maintaining these systems than we are really just, uh, you know, being so the plants or the soil system being so reliant on us that we have to be in there catering it almost uh, constantly, if you will. Exactly. Uh, so I kind of wanted to start there, man. I know you wear many hats. I know you're doing the Bokashi. We'll get into that deeper as well. Yeah. Uh, and then I know that you were the the co-founder, I believe, or co you know, you're, you're yeah. co-founder of the Michigan uh, Compost Cup. So I feel like that's another little thing that our industry has been watching you and and watching the things that you're doing and some of more of the educational stuff. And that's why I wanted uh, to reach out to you so that we could have you on the show today. Because awesome. uh, Leighton and I, and obviously Peter, uh, just the more that people are educating, you know, I, I've put on a few events in my life, not maybe at that same level that you did. And and really throwing a huge cup like that and, and that kind of stuff is immense work behind the scenes. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff sometimes is a thankless job. So I just wanted you to know that a lot of us are watching that uh, and we appreciate what you're doing and, and creating the awareness of uh, really what it takes to get to to high level composting. So just wanted to start there, man. I, I toot your horn a little bit because I feel yeah. like. A lot of people have been watching you and that's the best part of this platform is that we can kind of give those people that might not necessarily have the platform on a variety of different areas uh, to yeah. kind of just come with uh, Peter's show and just kind of get that one stop shop where a lot of people are going to be educated from you today. Awesome, guys. I truly appreciate it. Um, this platform is awesome. I've learned so much from you guys and this is truly an honor. So I'm happy to be here. You know what, uh, before we get too crazy, you know, I wanted to give you big ups for, for putting that compost cup on. Um, a friend of mine, Eric, associate of Eric and I out here put the first annual Ventura compost cup on and we brought in all of the local heavy hitted uh, producers of compost. And it was really eye opening to see how people viewed or judged compost. Now they had no yeah. chemistry, they had no biologicals, they had nothing. To work from and yet they were picking now i was fortunate enough to be able to scope each and every sample before um i had the judges look at it so i was kind of like playing devil's advocate to right see, you know which direction that they would lean in uh, without telling them which ones that i had uh ranked or rated uh based on the biological activities so um was that something that you guys did as well in in your judgments so yeah we definitely got this idea from the venturi connie cup but uh like I just, we've been so busy with the harvest and everything or just everything this summer. And so like, we're like, okay, let's just get this together. A community event, you know, we're building soil, we're building community. Let's have fun. Let's talk about composting, but maybe next year, let's uh, start planning it a lot earlier and get all this groundwork done. And so like we can actually have a cup, a, a competition. And so, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk to you about some of these different aspects of what we'd actually judge compost on because 
we can look at all these quantifiable things and we can count microbes under the scope, but like, unless you're giving it to a plant and, and testing it and seeing what the plant thinks, it's like, you're never getting the full picture. And so I think there's uh, a lot that we can plan out and, and look forward to next year for sure. We had the same situation. We pulled it together in a very short period of time. Yeah. But we still had an amazing um, outcome. I mean, we had over 70 some odd samples that came in. Oh, wow. I, yeah, I rejected probably 20 of them just due to the fact that they were horrible anaerobic, yeah. stinky uh, compost. But yeah. that being said, they, people still tried. You know, they, they sent in samples, which was, was great. And again, it's, it's more about raising awareness than per se judgment. Um, this is something I'm hoping to do um, with Peter in the future and do a series on what is compost. Yep. Because we really don't have a definition of it. And for real. It's ground up organic matter, it's still valuable as a carbon source. I mean, yeah, yeah it's a herbicide, <laughs> it kills everything. Yep. But, but then there's the other end of it, the biological mayonnaise where it's been composted down to a point where it's just silt. And yep. so then where is the middle? Where, where is the where is the balance? And each one of these has a value in a different application, but using it in the wrong application is not going to give you the kind of, the kind of results that you want. So yeah, we 100%. should Yeah, we should definitely chop it up off offline about well, how do we put a parameter? What 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 are the goals of judging compost? Cuz it's not yeah. like it's not like smoking weed, right? You can't just say, oh, well, this tastes good and this smells good and, and this has this effect, like yep. you said, without applying it to plants. So, And what kind of plant? We're in the soil right. succession, you know? It's like you got to have different composts for different purposes, you know? And that's what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah. Um, amen, dude. Amen. So we're on the same sheet for sure. And, and <laughs> yeah, there's going to be quite a bit of work to kind of set up a – uh, a foundation, say, um, to build off of as to, you know, how best yeah. to approach this particular issue and what is awesome. So, I would absolutely love to, uh, to talk a little bit more yeah, about, yeah, about all this. Plan sure. Go we will for sure. So Brian, I don't know how you wanted to lead off today, but I just wanted to compliment him on, on doing the work. Yeah. I just wanted him to know, like a lot of people are watching you, dude, you know, and you know, hopefully now after today, there's just that other springboard and I hope that we yeah. can all prop each other up. I know that, you know, on the commercial side of things, you're doing stuff at a, a thermophilic level. Uh, and then you're kind of, as far as I understand your process, and please correct me if I'm wrong, then it kind of maybe chills for a little bit. Then you're adding your composting worms and kind of then taking that to the next level, especially how I feel by using uh, cover crop instead of maybe burlap sacks or newspapers, that kind of stuff that's maybe uh, old school thinking now with some of the stuff that seems to be developing. Um, yeah, exactly. But I really wanted to get into first, I mean, if, if on the commercial level, like, does it seem like the red wiggler is the one to go with? I, I know a lot of people have kind of questions about that. I just wanted to dive deeper into your process, because I feel like, um, again, at the commercial level, how can you argue with that? Like the proof yeah. is in the end, end product that you're making. So, uh, you know, what what composting worms seem to be best? And then if you can't afford those, what are some of the ones that might be? Uh, better to use or some of the night crawlers that kind of stuff just really yeah, wanted to dive sure. deeper from that man and um and i'm i got my notepad and, and pen ready as well so excited for sure. to listen so, from so real quick i just want to say the place that i work at is wormies and that's not me uh i'm part of the team there right and so i've talked with uh luis on the owner about different composting worms and everything you know um which ones we should try out and he's heard you know, like uh, some of the jumpers or like the, I think the Alabama ones, they're pretty aggressive and uh, they can like actually eat the red wigglers or something like that. And so honestly, we've just been having such good success with red wigglers. It's like, why fix what isn't broken? But like, so that's the only ones that we've intentionally like populated our piles with is these red wigglers. But what's really cool about having compost right on the ground, right on the soil is like we have night crawlers come up at night and we see grits of sand in our compost. It's like, we've never added sand to any of this. And like, where the hell is it coming from? It's like, it's coming from those night crawlers that are mining those minerals that all that stuff from like 15, 20 feet down and it's bringing it up and it's taking organic matter from the top and it's doing what worms do. And like, so we, we've never added night crawlers intentionally, but um, the fact that we have it on the ground lets biology do its thing, you know? It's uh, a little bit different than some of these raised um, 
like flow through systems that you see, which seem incredible for sure. Um, but I think there's a lot of benefit to just letting biology do its thing right on the ground. Dude, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, that is, that is uh, standalone. I don't know anybody that's commercially producing vermicompost in contact with soil. So kudos yeah. to you guys. So what is Thank your, you. what is your bedding? What are you starting with? Okay, so we are like a compost pickup service. And so we take food scraps from all over the city. Um, there's a bunch of really cool like juice bars and kombucha places and like some really cool like health oriented restaurants around our city and we're super fortunate. And so we take a lot of this um, food waste and we collect a lot of manure from local farms. Um, we collect wood chips from tree removal services, which is like a huge piece of it, like adding all of that the wood chips and letting the mushrooms do their thing and letting the fungi do their thing. That's like the next level. But uh, so we take all of this biomass, right? And we mix it up. We try to find the right ratio of browns to greens and everything. And uh, then we do the thermophilic process and we let it cook. Uh, we let it, you know, heat up to 150 ish and uh, cook off any potential pests or seeds or, or pathogens, you know, um, that could be in the manure sources. And so, we cook it all in these big hex bins, um, which are actively aerated static piles pretty much. And so like, instead of flipping your compost um, to make sure that everything goes through the core and, and heats up and aerating it, um, we just have these PVC pipes that are right underneath these huge piles. And so every like half hour or so, um, these fans turn on and it blows this air up through the piles and aerates everything and uh, maintains really nice even moisture and and temperature and everything from what we've seen like there's definitely some variability uh with the recipe but that's what it's all about is is figuring it out and uh you know trying to improve every time but basically we cook all this stuff down and so unfortunately once it gets over like 130 degrees you start cooking off some of your beneficial guys as well as the potential pathogens and so um when we take it out of these bins and lay it flat into the worm rows we let it cool down but then we also are doing everything we can to reintroduce um, more biology to inoculate it with as much life as possible so it's not just you know the, the thermophilic process that maybe killed off some of the good stuff we do the thermophilic process and then we add some fermented bokashi scraps and then we add um like spent mushroom blocks and then we do the cover cropping like we were talking about. And like, we just add all this life back on top of it. And it just creates this beautiful, beautiful ecosystem. And like, there's so many benefits to the cover crops alone, but like the mycorrhizae thing, you know, like you need eight weeks for that mycorrhizal spore uh, to actually do anything in association with the plant. And like, it needs that association with the roots to even, you know, start doing its thing. And so like, if you don't have living roots in your soil like you, you don't have that full connection you know? um and so i think that's something that really sets us above is like our use of cover crop and like how much these crops are you know putting these exudates into the soil and stimulating these microbes and uh protecting the the compost physically as, as a cover and like the list goes on and on of the benefits for sure Wow. Now, one of the other ways that you're speeding <clears throat> things up and kind of improving on Mother Nature is you're also using um, spent mushroom blocks, correct? Yeah. Yeah, we have this awesome, a good friend of mine, actually, um, mushroom cultivator here in town. He does so many gourmet mushrooms and some medicinal mushrooms and just has, you know, just a plethora of spent blocks that have so much life in them still. But like at that uh, gourmet level, you know, a lot of the times it's it's one flush and done. Uh, you, you can't have any trichoderma in there or anything but like and that's the cool thing about like i used to be into mushroom cultivation as well and i'm, I'm still in it for sure but like i'm getting away from the monoculture aspect but like when you have when you're trying to cultivate mushrooms and you create the sterile environment for anything to breed right and you try to inoculate this monoculture with your one strain of mushroom like we know that's not how the the world works is like we don't live in a sterile world so like you're gonna have competitors flying through the air and you're going to culture like trichoderma some green mold and uh that's like the bane of the mushroom growers existence you know it's like they, they hate that shit. but you take those blocks 
that have this green mold on it, you break it up, you put it in the compost and it all just balances itself out. And like, then you have more healthy mushrooms pop up out of your compost pile. It's like, it gives it the second chance that they need. It gives it that, you know, it's the biological intelligence figuring itself out. And like, they're incredibly capable of, of doing what they need to do. But when you put them into a, a sterile setting, then they're disadvantaged. You know, I, I'd love to back it up a little bit first uh, for the audience. Um, pathogen yeah. reduction um, is probably one of the most important things that you can do, especially if you're dealing with manures and um, food scraps. Yeah. So that being said, um, do you have a state law or a required uh, level of pathogen reduction? And if so, what is it? And if you could uh, tell us about it, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure. So right now, I know we're commercial scale, but honestly, we're a really small composting business. Um, we're like a, a worm farm, technically, you know, and we're not taking in enough yards of biomass at this point to even need the composting license. But like, this is all stuff that we're really working for, um, like over this winter and into the next year is like really scaling up and getting our, our big boy license and learning all this regulations and everything like that. So it's a... Uh, it's been a process for sure. There's a couple of us on the team and we've been, you know, passionate about the composting and everything and, and making sure that we are, you know, uh, cooking up our compost at like 150 for, uh, I think, 10 days or something like that. I forget the, the exact rules, but, uh, you know, we're, we're doing our due diligence of making sure that everything really heats up first before it, it goes through. But then that's the thing too, is like, we're not selling just thermophilic compost. We take that thermophilic compost, we lay it on the ground, and then we introduce all the, the chunkies that we sifted out of our last finished compost. And so that's all full of like this wood chips that are fully colonized with mycelium and all these worms and worm cocoons and everything. And it's basically like the mother culture that goes in between each each pile, you know? And so like we introduce that stuff to this thermophilic compost and then, uh, it does its thing and we let it sit there for like 10 months. And so like the whole process is like a, a whole entire year long and uh, it it does its thing. And the, the worms are absolutely magic. They, they can eat stuff and, and clean it up. And it's uh, the end product is some incredible black gold. So you're uh, so you're you're only putting in um, the food scraps and all of these uh, what I want to call feed stocks in through the thermophilic process. You're not turning it. You're using air as yeah. a method to balance both moisture, uh, temperature. Um, so that's great. And then you take the feedstock after this 10-day pathogen reduction process, and then you use that to lay it out and introduce your worms. Is that correct? correct? Yeah. And so, like, and then anything that we uh, add at, at that level, um, you know, it's the it's been fermented the bokashi food scraps. And then the mushroom blocks, like, uh, yeah, there's a lot of the mushroom blocks have the trichoderma, like, contaminant, you know, but, like, you break that up and you add that to the soil and it just eats some of the fungi in there. But then it ends up getting out competed because, you know, there, there's so much other stuff in there. And, like, trichoderma is a, a healthy part of the soil. I don't know if you have anything to say about that, Leighton. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> we can go on and on about trichoderma. Oh, yeah. but yeah, Before yeah. we go there, let's let's back it up. Do you do temperature probes of your um, your feedstock after you've introduced the worms? Feedstock after, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We we have thermometers everywhere at all the time. Yeah, beautiful. So how how does the the compost react, or excuse me, uh, the the feedstock after it's gone through pathogen pathogen reduction and you've introduced worms and all of the spent mushroom blocks and your bakashi? Um, does it start to heat back up again or does it? Yeah. So we've noticed a couple different variants. And so like, it's it still, I think it comes down to that, that base recipe and that we're still dialing that in and it, you know, just getting into measuring carbon and nitrogen ratios. And that's a whole rabbit hole, you know, that depends the, like you get manure, you know, and you got to judge how much bedding is in there and how much urine was soaked into that bedding and like these make big differences you know and so like we're just guesstimating as, as best as we can trying to get this right recipe but sometimes and sometimes intentionally too we'll add like over the winter we'll add uh, a lot more nitrogen just to keep that pile warm throughout the winter you know um, it can have 
amount of snow on top and it's warm enough that it never freezes. It just constantly melts that tiny bit of snow on top and keeps the right moisture content. And like worms love it in there. Like every spring we go in there, there's way more cocoons than you'd normally find. Um, and I think it's part of that overwintering process and maybe that, uh, you know, they, they think that they might die or something. And so they're just trying to pass on their genes and, and do what they, they do. And so like they have a huge population boom over the winter. We, we know you, you are doing some great work there, brother. All right. So let's, we'll reel it back into uh, fungals. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it is well known that, you know, some of the um, important steps, uh, successionary steps for fungus, specifically with the end goal of trying to get saprobes to colonize, um, is these uh, early yeasts and, and trichoderma and stuff. They are, they're stepping stone, the, the foundation yeah. of, of the ecological succession of the, of the system. So by introducing those spent mushroom blocks, you're, you're basically providing the feedstocks for that evolution to occur. So, you know, kudos again, Awesome, man. you know, that, that, that substrate that they can't use is the ultimate foundation for building out um, a fungally dominant um, compost or vermicompost. So, you know, again, kudos for, for doing the work, my friend. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to get a hold of some of this stuff. I mean, yeah, I, man, I can't wait to send you a sample <laughs> right after this. Let's, let's do it. Uh, the, the only person I've ever found in my life that, that ended up with a fungally dominant compost um, or excuse me, vermicompost was a, a guy, a friend that I worked with um, down at Rodale for 18 months. And, you know, he and I were, you know, just, uh, you know, guys that were doing the work there. And, and you know, he was all about the, the vermicompost and I was all about the fish fris, fish waste. Yeah. And But when we started collaborating, oh, man, we had so much fun. And the end result of his product was similar to yours in the essence that he did similar steps as far as, collecting those feed stocks um, as well as collecting um, fungally dominant um, bedding feed stock, uh, you know, like the chips that were covered with mycelium. Yeah. Um, and that was the key to his end result, but he would always have a, you know, really high fungi to bacterial, which is unusual yeah. in vermicompost because the, the, basically the, the worms are there to produce bacteria. Exactly. Yep. So if you're getting a fungally dominant, um, vermicompost at the end, you know, big ups to huge ups because that sure. is key to, you know, the best vermicompost around is, is having that fungal presence. Yeah. Definitely so, proud of that for sure. Yeah. You should be proud of that. And, and let's, let's bounce back into cover cropping. I mean, dude, I, I, when I was down at Rodale, Elaine was adamant that you keep your pile covered and don't let any plants in there and that they were going to steal, you know, nutrients. And I was like the op, exact opposite yeah. like, no the plants are providing miles of rhizosphere and yeah. that's where all the magic is happening 100%. so why would, yeah why would you not do that and and yeah. why would you not let the plants protect the moisture level yeah. and build tilth so tell me more about what kind of cover crops you're playing with and how how robust is is the you know the amount of plants that are that are living on your um on your your end piles yeah, so we've definitely been doing some experimentation, you know. Um, we did a lot of squash this past year because, like, those huge leaves, they just keep everything covered so well. And then we get a lot of food and uh, a lot of stuff that I ferment for, like, bloom feeding, you know. And so, like, uh, there's a benefit to having a cover crop that's going to give you, you know, uh, a nice product at the end. Um, but other than that, so, like, and we saw some – some issues with that so like maybe we don't want to grow these huge squash plants because they're taking so much moisture out of there you know so maybe it's it's not the most ideal because those huge tubers in, are like you know just entirely water weight um and so we, it started off that we had to water the pile way less but then once they got huge you know they were just sucking everything out of there and so like maybe or maybe squash isn't the best option for that or maybe you just gotta uh, keep them smaller but other than that, we've been doing a blend of uh, like hairy vetch and field peas, you know, uh, fixate some of that nitrogen in, in there. Um, we've been doing some grasses and that's where like the, I think the more of the mycorrhizal um, culturing techniques come from. Uh, is it ryegrass? 
Uh, yeah, in Sudan. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. That's a real good one. For sure. And so, like, uh, we have been experimenting with that, and like, if we should inoculate, you know, uh, with mycorrhizal spores first, or like, you know, if they're naturally going to be there. And so, like, that's something that's going to come as we grow and like get more into testing and have you know funds to test as much as we want to. You know, like, we can do these different trials and try to quantify it a little bit better. But right now, we think you know, like having those roots in there, there's clearly some magic happening that maybe we, we can't quantify as much as you, you'd like to, but that's soil in general, man. Like we're just scratching the surface of this stuff and like, we we don't know shit. And like, Dude, we are, we're all in the same boat, man. Yeah. We're all in the same boat. Some of this meta barcoding shit that oh my God. doing the, the communities of biology and, and what we've learned now, which is even crazier is the sap road fungi is pretty consistent throughout the entire cycle of the soil system but the bacterial communities come and go so quickly it's not funny and we have yep. no idea what the fuck's going on no hmm. idea um so back backing up to mycorrhizae so yeah mycorrhizae does travel in the air and, and if you've got local indigenous um, grasses that are growing and they're super healthy chances mm -hmm. are they are colonized um, a trick that we used to use back in the day was um, literally go to, you know, beat up places like, you know, disturbed soil alongside roadsides. Yeah. And if you find this plant that is just absolutely thriving, dig it up and go back and put it on your compost pile. Now you just brought in all of the Vikings yeah. the or survivors in the biological world. Chances are you're going to have mycorrhizae, indigenous mycorrhizae on that plant. That's awesome, man. Otherwise, how the fuck is it surviving? Yeah. How is it getting water? How is it getting nutrients? It yeah. can't. So the only way it's getting those nutrients and that water is through that mycorrhizae. So by digging it up and planting it in your pile, Guess what you just did, brother? <laughs> awesome. So when you're saying that, like along the roadside in these disturbed soils, we see a lot of uh, mullein up here in disturbed soils. And so like, do you happen to know um, if that plant in particular, you know? Uh, well, is... put it this way, 90% of all plants that we have studied and looked at um, are colonized or accept a certain level of colonization of mycorrhizae. Right. So, okay. Chances are yes. Um, there's a great resource, uh, my friend uh, Efren at um, Microroots. Uh, okay. I think I got that right. He does um, he does the actual um, colonization rates of plants. So oh, sweet. Cheap money. You could pull one of those things, send it off to him, and he would he would be able to tell you how colonized it actually is. Um, and and this is like one of those things that. You know, each plant is going to want a different level of colonization. They're not going to want to give up. You know, they don't want to let 100 percent colonization happen. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, you, you actually start getting diminishing returns in a lot of species at over 50 percent colonization, which is kind of weird if you think about it, because you'd think that, that they'd want to have as much access to nutrients and water as possible. But there is a balance within the plant. Right. They're given the, the fungi something in exchange. So exactly. like maybe that. Yeah, they have to upregulate all the exudates to a point where it, it doesn't. Yeah. Oh, and man, some of the some balance. of the some of the work that's coming out now, um, showing mycorrhizae as a highway, like literally on the outside yeah. of that hyphae, is uh, a, organisms going one way, the liquid inside is going the other way. Yeah. So there's some thermodynamic or not thermal hydrodynamics that's going on as well as the introduction of bacteria into the friggin' fungi itself and then traveling with the nutrients. Yeah. So and that's, oh my gosh. The plants are asking for, you know, biology, asking for nutrients, asking for water. So that colonization of mycorrhizae is so critical. And mm -hmm. I, I'm willing to bet anything that that's one of the biggest problems we have in our climate right now is because we, every time you disturb the soil, it takes years for that stuff to come back and to operate. Yeah. So where have we not disturbed soil? Very little places left. Yeah. So that's why it's so important to foster, to nourish, the, you know, these types of organisms back into this decimated soil. So the work exactly. that you're doing there is providing just that. Uh, you know, you're, you're by default fixing soil on scale, which is huge.
dude. It's yeah, huge. That's just, that's what we're trying to do. You're Make doing it as it. easy as possible, you know, to to inoculate these these dead dirts and bring them back to soil. And you know, the idea of biocomplete compost, you know, that has everything in there. You introduce it; it starts that communication with whatever plants it comes in contact with, and they figure it out. You know, it's it's introducing this biointelligence back to the system that's been decimated and really dumbed down. And like uh, plants and and microbes have been evolving and and problem solving together for eons. You know, and it's just recently that we've separated them and tried to to grow with these synthetic methods and to you know put these microbes out of a job or you know like to we've been we've been killing these microbes and we've been feeding these plants directly and we've made these plants absolutely dependent on our synthetic fertilizers and uh and they're not intelligent anymore and our crops aren't nutrient dense anymore and they're not full of the humic and fulvic acids that our soils once had and so like it's really accumulating really really fast and there's all sorts of health problems that are happening now i think directly because of our broken soil and so like this is something that you know doctors aren't talking enough about or like our food our broken food system and our, our broken health directly comes from our soil like soil health is human health and like it's something that we all need to pay a lot more attention to and like what can we be doing to uh inoculate our soil because it's decimated it doesn't have the microbes and then what can we do to like inoculate our guts because the same exact thing and like the the similarities between what's going on in the soil food web and like the nutrient cycling in our guts and like the list of microbes in the soil and in our guts it's like the same exact thing man it's we are humic beings we are from the soil and like it's uh Dude. it's time people eat some mushrooms and oh, <laughs> roll around oh. in the dirt and uh, wake up to that you know beautiful rant brother beautiful rant yeah i you know i don't know if this is common knowledge but they don't even teach nutrition at medical school no hello that diet is everything is medicine. food is yeah. all the medicine we need we yeah. don't need pharmaceuticals oh. but yet the pharmaceutical industry is the one that started the medical schools and started taking over the medical industry they don't want us healthy. No. <laughs> the sicker we are, the more money we make them. That is the insanity of humanity. So That's guys like my... you and I are up against. Yo. Go ahead. You, you roll. One of my biggest realizations, you know, it's like just seeing how much they want us sick and, and reliant on them. And like, I think composting and, and regenerating soil and growing your own crops is like the most rebellious thing you could possibly do. And like, that's a big reason of why I got into to all of this. And like, um, so I started growing when I was like 17 in the back of the woods or whatever. But a couple years later, um, I had the opportunity to buy like a used grow tent. And so I started growing and like pro mix with a couple bottles of Fox Farms and like just realized that that shit was not for me at all. I hated pH up and pH down and like, I was so disconnected from the plant, from the soil, from everything. And like, granted, I was under some really cheap Chinese blurples and like didn't have the right genetics. And like, who knows what would have happened if I if I had everything. But basically, um, I was like, this isn't for me. And so at that same time, I started looking at Instagram and seeing all these living soils and like the no till revolution hashtag was like a really big one. Um, and I found Subcool's, you know, super soil recipe, and that led me to learning about earthworm castings. And, like, I heard that, like, compost and, and castings, they were, like, the most important part of that that mixture. And, like, it was really important to find the good ones. And so that sent me down the rabbit hole of ordering uh, a worm bin and worms from Uncle Jim's worm farm, you know, and uh, composting my own food scraps. And I was a, a pretty poor and busy college student at the time. And I quickly learned that I was not eating anything good and I couldn't put anything beneficial into my worm bin. And like, that was like a huge, you know, uh, alarm for me uh, that I couldn't produce good compost because I was eating like trash. And so like, I started eating better and cooking at home more, you know, and, and giving my worms good scraps. And uh, 
they created fantastic compost and I was like I just saw that connection and like composting is um like life after death and like you don't view waste as waste anymore you don't view things as like the end of the the line it's just another stop on the journey and like you can regenerate this waste and create beautiful black gold like and so I, I was just absolutely hooked and so I uh I was looking up everything about the worms and everything and then one day I hopped on Instagram and some artificial intelligence because of my search history sent me a link to a or an, an advertisement for wormies and that's how I found that somebody was right here in my city uh composting and like the post said like protozoa and nematodes and you know beneficial bacteria and all these words that I was literally just learning and I was like holy fuck you know somebody teach me how to do this and it uh so that's one good example of artificial intelligence but uh or like how, how it's how it's benefited me but um I yeah tend, I tend to call that the universe hard at work <laughs> yeah for real <laughs> more so than artificial intelligence yeah absolutely man but I love what you talk about soil intelligence and yeah you know, that's a word that we need to use more um is is understanding that that communication between the plants and the soil and us is, is yeah. just important um so yeah you're dude you're doing the fucking work and you know um i love the way you talked about you know your own health because you learned it by default because of the worms i mean yeah. you know that that's something maybe that would spark uh the next generation to to begin to say hey i don't want to eat this shit anymore because it kills my fucking worms <laughs> right for real you know, if, if they looked What's at that worms, doing to me, right, right. If they looked at worms as kitty cats and dogs and, you know, every kid had to have one to, to get through fourth grade or whatever, and they had to learn how to take care of those worms. Well, wow. imagine the, the impact of the next generation would have. So maybe we could start a school revolution. Dude, that's something that Wormies has been really big into is uh, we teach, you know, educational programs to all ages, but like we're at elementary schools multiple times a year, you know, and uh, we have field trips come out to the farm and like the kids love the worms and they love getting dirty. And like, it's crazy that like we lose that imagination um, as we grow older and we don't want to get dirty anymore. And, like, and now like a lot of parents like don't even want their kids to get dirty and now they're not inoculating themselves with good soil you know they're not getting their hands in the dirt and i think that's really important to our immune systems and everything you know it's like from a young age to be able to roll around in some soil get healthy, your hands in some compost healthy soil right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah, there's uh there's there's some real deep work uh, being done on actual the negative effect of c-sections uh, yeah. because they're not going through the birth canal they're not yep. getting that critical immune building biology out of the gate and then compound that by not allowing your kid to play in the swamp and in the dirt and come home with dirty fingernails and you know eating yep. pies come on we used to do that shit as kids it was hell it was yeah part of growing up and so now you've got minimal immune system you've got minimal um gut biota and and bio biological biota um mm -hmm. and now you're washing your hands with antimicrobial fucking soap of course you're gonna get fucking sick right For real it, it, so, 99 of everything every day um, yeah. well, you know, um, right. and so by you bringing that awareness to kids at an early age and getting yeah. excited about it Dude, man, that's huge. That's freaking huge. That, that's the only way we're gonna save this 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 humanity. I agree, man. Is Gotta by teach the kids. You know, education, education, education. So you know, maybe you ought to do is give these kids a little worm box. <laughs> <laughs> hey, take that collar off that motherfucker. No worm play here, man. <laughs> No, but maybe maybe that would be the thing is like, you know, like a, a little cardboard box or something that, you know, you can get affordably or recycled and yeah. send these kids home with like five worms and say, hey, feed these worms really good food like you should be eating and you'll see how they'll grow and multiply and then you can release them in your mom's garden in spring. Man, I love that idea. We'll definitely do that. Dude, that'd be huge. And, and you know what? 
I'm working with some companies out here who will be starting to uh, the permitting process in California is insane. And Peter will yeah. testify to this. It's just it's just absurd. Um, they've been trying to get uh, large scale vermicomposting for I believe it's six years now that the CDC has been dragging this company through the fucking mud and billing them and feeding them to death. Jesus, man. But I believe they finally have the final paperwork and they will be able to begin construction sometime in January on a nice scale system. And and if, if that happens, dude, I'm going to do the same fucking thing. Find a way to make these little worm boxes and distribute them to kids and, yeah. you know, get that, get that ball rolling because someone has to do it, dude. And if we For don't, real. nobody is. Yep. So no, that's I love the thing is like, you can look at it like planting seeds or like inoculating, you know, whoever you're teaching with this information and like, they're going to take this information. They're going to combine it with their own life skills or whatever. And then they're going to take it back to their communities and inoculate others. And that network spreads, you know, and that knowledge spreads. And like, that's how we, we do these things is by hosting events like this and like the compost cups and like, you know, just doing our best to educate people. And uh, what's really cool about the compost cups or like any event is like, there's just some magic about getting together in person, you know, and, and getting to share the herb that you're most proud of and everything. And, uh, we went for like a, a UV lit mushroom walk. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those bioluminescent mushrooms, but we were all, a lot of us, we were, we were tripping balls in the woods, you know, with yeah. these UV mushrooms. I love and like, oh you my God. You knew what that face meant. You didn't have to <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was a good time. All man. kinds of avatar crazy shit, right? <laughs> Honestly, yep. Hey, but, so uh, go ahead. For getting into the, like the nitty gritty, like at your level, you know, how do you feel about like um, using worms to compost meats and citrus and stuff? I know some people say that you can do that. Other people say, why bother uh, at the level yeah. that you're at? How do, how do you feel, especially if you have, I would imagine in time, I don't know now, do you have access to where you have millions of worms? Because it's supposedly at that level, meat and citrus doesn't seem to matter as much. Yeah. So I think the main problem with like meat is uh, like pest problems like it's gonna attract rodents or whatever and unless you have it closed in um then it, you're gonna attract some pests that you, you probably don't want to have but i'd feel more comfortable uh like composting meat through the bokashi composting process where it's all contained and it can all you know ferment and eat itself and then from there tossing that into the these big worm piles but uh yeah i think uh citrus is no problem at all um with how much it's diluted and with all this other biomass it's like obviously you don't want to put your worms in a bin full of citrus it's way too acidic and i've heard a story about you know somebody putting they're going on vacation and they put like a half a pineapple on their worm bin you know like just keep them fed not for the week you know and they came back and their worms were all like melted and it's like terrible to hear but it's so like you don't want to overdo citrus but i think like on a large enough scale and if you're not you know if it's part of a, a larger mix then it's all good Layton, do you have anything about that yeah i'd love to hit on that meat um you're absolutely right about the meat um it will bring in pests and another thing too is that the the worms don't eat the food they eat the bacteria exactly 100 percent the food so yeah. meat takes too long to break down and it starts okay. to rot and smell and bring in pests and flies yeah. and all kinds of other things. So your suggestion on Bakashi is, is spot on. So this buddy of mine, Craig Tester, he's part of my study group, weekly study group. Um, and he's come up with a method of um, basically a J-Dom ferment. So he puts yeah. all that shit in a big toter, puts a bunch of screens or a screen and a bunch of weights on it so that all of that is below the water level. Yep. And then he waits about five days and guess what? He's got a vinaigrette. And huh. not only is it a vinaigrette, but it's a wedding agent. It's a surfactant. So you can take that shit. It doesn't stink. And you can spray it on raw ground up organic matter or, or un, uh, unmatured compost. And it will literally suck into the fiber. And better yet, it's full of secondary and tertiary metabolites that feed the biology on a quick, short-term uh, method. So it's just a win-win-win. So that's the best way to handle it. And you you basically are doing that with Bakashi. Yeah, so, man, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I yeah. Like 
maybe that's a little trick you can try as well yeah for sure we're always down to experiment and try something new for sure yeah it's spot on about the citrus because it de it definitely affects ph so that's one of those low and slow uh, too much of that yep. stuff definitely cause problems for sure definitely uh, the job i'm working on out here on gom they get bins of of uh you know um lemons <laughs> and it's like they all come at once so dave green the manager of of Agriman's, uh, facilities out here is always struggling with how best to incorporate them into um the compost without drastically affecting the ph and and yeah. you know shutting it down so yeah there'll be there'll be some fun work uh, uh this year uh, while i'm playing with them to to better understand how to um perhaps break that uh citrus down a little bit more before introducing it into the pile um but for sure that's, yeah that's <laughs> i haven't started that one yet <laughs> i got a few <laughs> other ones in the front of it <laughs> oh yeah there's always something else but Are great you? question brad great question. yeah well in, in addition appreciate that um uh, when we're then taking it to the next level, are you using other decomposers? Like, are you going out of your way? I know before we went on air, Peter asked if you were using the Black Soldier Fly. You said no, but that's something you wanted to get into. Yeah. Are you naturally maybe getting the, the springtails to show up? Or are you? Oh, my God, dude. So yeah. we call it wormies, and we give the credit to the worms. But literally, we got the whole entire soil food web there. And, like, we need to give more credit to them. Like, like I try to, but, like, we got springtails. Um and pill bugs you know just shredding all, all sorts of arabitid mites or orbited however you say it but like the, the shredding mites you the know the orbital mites yeah, yeah that's yeah. how i say it huh? yeah latent you could probably correct the gammases right. and the orobotids or whatever the no i'll yeah. keep keep it keep it without the greek terms man, For real, man. Yeah, For real. Yeah. we got all <laughs> sorts of shredders in there that you know take this organic matter and they're incredibly good at shredding it down into pieces that are big or small enough for the microbes to the further nutrient cycle and uh yeah like Leighton mentioned earlier um the worms aren't actually eating the food scraps or anything they're they're eating the microbes that are eating everything it's so, like we have all these shredders breaking down all these big pieces into small enough pieces and then these worms come and they eat these microbes that are eating all that stuff and like it was like a big realization to me um once i i started working there a lot is like I'm not a worm farmer. I'm a microbe farmer. And like, you, you gotta, you gotta create the conditions for these microbes. Cause that's what the worms are after. And like moisture content is absolutely vital. Like you don't want things on the dry end because these microbes need, they're aquatic, you know, they, they need that biofilm. They need that bit of water to move around and set up colony. And uh, if it dries out, then your microbes aren't, aren't thriving and then your worms aren't thriving. So like, you really want to to focus on moisture content is, is what I'm Oh, at. dude. You know what? That is, that is one of the biggest problems. You know, people freak out because they overwater or underwater their plants. Yeah. Compost is even more critical. Um, yeah. So understanding that those microbes are breaking off either the hydrogen or the oxygen from the water to fuel their processes of digesting the nitrogen right. and carbon. So it's all part of a cycle that's so critical. And, you know, when you start to understand that the smaller the particle, the more surface area it has, the more colonization it can happen, the more biofilm. So you have start with the, the hydrogen being broken off, the, the oxygen being broken off, allowing for more biology, allowing for more biofilm, allowing for just it expands, 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 expands exponentially. And so, yeah, those are some really, really important things for, for people to understand, whether it's vermicompost or regular compost. If yeah. you don't have the right moisture level, you're going to have all kinds of imbalances and you're not going to get to that end result as quickly as you want, which is the ultimate biocomplete soil food web compost. Yeah. So, yeah. Kudos for you to bring them that up. That is that is really important. Thank you. And well said. So when we're getting it to the next level and we're, you know, optimal conditions and stuff like that, it, it always seemed like we were right. We were moving on uh, 90 days. It seemed like composting worms reproduce whatever they had, or this is, this is what we were kind of taught. So if you start with a thousand worms every 90 days, then 2000, another 90 days, 4,000. And so you could kind of base that kind of stuff. Do you see that on the same level that you're at that they, in again, optimal conditions with the right feed that they really can produce that quickly? Yeah, they 
they reproduce like crazy. You can take a handful out of pretty much anywhere and find worms and worm cocoons. And, you know, each cocoon has between one and like 20 baby worms in there. But uh, basically like only between like one and five will actually survive. But there's no shortage of, uh, of worms at all. Yeah, it seems like once everything kind of takes off, um, that's we've always kind of used the words it comes alive and then it becomes thriving. Yep. Um, and it seems like if you stay on focus, especially if you're the newer worm farmer, if you really focus on those 90 days and you're seeing stuff really start to improve, that's when you can start to incorporate a lot of the ideas, the avocado tech, the other things that are kind of like, uh, you know, allowing you to play around uh, and, and, and improve things. I know that we had met, briefly mentioned on red wigglers. Uh, like, what do you think? Because I've personally, in the larger bins, uh, simple worm farming, if it's a hundred gallon, it seems like I could use night crawlers, uh, European, um, as well as the African. And then uh, I would use a little bit of the lava rock. And then I would go uh, heavy with the um, Alabama jumpers, Georgia jumpers. And it seemed like they would stay down there for a while. I didn't ever, I haven't disturbed the soil that deep. To kind of see what what's going on yeah. uh, what are your thoughts on that do you feel like i've always called it like the four horsemen of do you, do you think that's overkill uh, i just love to hear your, your theory on that i mean if, if you're into trying that stuff out then no it's not overkill this is all fun stuff to to learn from you know but uh yeah like i said i, I really don't have much experience besides the red wigglers and uh the, the night crawlers that occasionally come um but yeah that's super interesting to you said that you have like two different species that are kind of separated by like the lava rock on how I, you know, put the lava rock out and then I'll usually, um, unbeknownst cause this is really before uh, Leighton and I became cl uh, friends, uh, using the sphagnum peat moss. So I would heavily do the sphagnum peat moss. Uh, and then there would be more of like the night crawlers that seem to be building the dissolved oxygen channels. And then I was constantly feeding the organic matter, feeding really the soil food web, uh, on top and then boosting the red wiggler population. So, uh, very minimal uh, jumpers, very minimal night crawlers, and that seemed like they, it seemed like they were balanced things out on yep. their own. Yeah, I, I totally believe that for sure. The worms are crazy good at balancing it, and like they won't overpopulate themselves if food is running low. You know, like th they're smart, and uh, they'll get out of the way if things are too hot or if they're too acidic or whatever. Um, they'll go to the the side and they'll find a spot that they can survive and so like that's another benefit of having them right on the ground you know is um like one we, we don't introduce them if the piles are too hot we got the thermometers and everything but like if things were to spike in temperature for whatever reason you know like they're gonna get out of there and they're we're not gonna cook our worms like so <clears throat> and then they'll come right back because that's where everything is that like why would you rather be somewhere else when there's an all-you-can-eat buffet right there so yeah, you know, I'd love to touch on that just real briefly is that yeah. um, that was the first time I'd ever seen Richard down at Rodale was the first time I'd ever seen somebody do what I want to call free range, which is what you're doing. Free range mm -hmm. from a compost, yeah. not uh -huh. in a container. Um, and he what he would do is pile up hay bales all the way around the outside, yep. put his bedding in so that it went halfway up the hay bales. And he would set these farms up at different farmers, organic farmers. Mm -hmm. And the organic farmers would just throw all their drops or things that, that didn't sell onto the pile. It would roll down the sides and get trapped between the hay and the, and the pile. Yeah. So we go in and work through it and then go back into the center of the pile. If nice. Yeah. The pile. So it was a great way of uh, keep continuously feeding the, 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 the worms without ever getting to a situation where shit went anaerobic because if it did go anaerobic it was just on the very sides yeah and eventually they'd work their way into it but um you know it was just again with these flow through systems i think they are missing these critical uh, connections to earth and yeah. what i would call um natural biological systems not introduced to biology Exactly. So, um, again, you know, huge kudos to you for, for doing this, you know, free range. <laughs> I think you probably, I love it, yeah, I I just start saying that free range marketing term. Yeah, yeah. Marketing term. <laughs> Our worms are free range. Yeah. Oh, come man. on, Brian. You're all about the marketing <laughs> angle, right? So, for sure. um, I do want to say one thing about, um, Georgia jumpers. Um, so first of all, I'm going to back it all the way up to the ice age. After the ice age, we did not have any kind of earthworms in mm -hmm. the United States of America and North America. They, they were decimated. 
Um, they were reintroduced as, as settlers came in, as indigenous people came in, um, you know, the cartoons came in with their food and their, and their stores and eventually night crawlers and, um, you know, these other types, there's probably three or four different types that I can say are indigenous, but they aren't They're They were introduced at some point in time. Yeah. Now these Georgia jumpers came from, I believe, uh, Asia. Um, they came in as a great uh, worm for fishing because they they're they're also nicknamed the crazy snake worm because if you've seen them, they friggin move like crazy. Yeah. Their their action is completely different than what I want to call the more traditional or indigenous species of of worms here, uh, at least the ones that I grew up with. Now um, there was a gentleman that wrote a paper. I believe he was out of Vermont. Uh, back around 2010, maybe eight, about this invasive worm that was was tearing up the what I want to call duff layer duff layer of the forest, and I read about it because I'm a science geek and you know I'm always into you know understanding you know different types of um, invasions. Uh, yeah. I, I don't like to call them invasion invasions because this is what happens on the planet naturally. Uh, species come in and they move out. Uh, whether it's climate related or not, or whether it's just over overproduction, overabundance, and then lack thereof. Yeah. But I have witnessed firsthand the decimation of these G Georgia jumpers in a forest system uh, behind the house I was living in in Connecticut. It basically turned the soil into rice krispies. So there was no fungus. Yeah. There was no saprobes. There was no duff layer, um, and it was just, just like like dried up rice krispies so please be careful about letting those out into nature um, and please read up more about this people in the audience about you know being careful about or being responsible about introducing new species too quickly to too many areas absolutely um, yeah so and I, i've been working with a couple of gardeners back in connecticut who lost their whole vegetable gardens to this and they're you know trying to figure out how to again being careful um cut back the population not not kill you know but yeah. just keep it at bay yeah. so there's some work with the uh, electrocution believe it or not um hmm. and trying to drive them up to the surface and then collecting them and then composting them uh, so that you're not like you know wasting the biomass yeah for sure but just a heads up on that one the, the, those can be really problematic thank you i think we're going to stick with the red wigglers well, I will so say that um, a lot of the the worm farming here in Colorado, you know, I've kind of peeled the veil with some of those companies and a lot of them are using the African night crawler. They feel it's like a, a better hybrid uh, for kind of more building those dissolved, dissolved oxygen channels and kind of maybe just uh, a better overall worm. Because I do feel like the red wigglers take a little bit to, to break things down. But once their numbers, populations get there, no problem. The African yeah. seems like there's you know it is really that nice hybrid within the the european night crawler seems to be the fatter worm so you do get those nicer dissolved oxygen channels right uh, but at the same time it's um it just takes a, a lot longer for those to build up so that's why i've always tried to experiment with uh yeah all four of them i just wasn't ever really sure if you know there's maybe a placebo effect of it i i learned from ganja sauna like you had mentioned yeah. Sometimes if the worms don't have enough uh, organic matter that they will kind of go after each other. Uh, yeah. But I felt like as long as my bins have been, especially worm farming, 100 gallons or more, you know, the fabric pot, not bin, but fabric pots. Yeah. Uh, so there is enough uh, oxygen as well as using the, the composting worms for dissolved oxygen channels where you don't get that co uh, compaction like you would normally see, especially when you first are starting to understand composting. That's why I've always been a big proponent especially if you're trying to learn how to do this and maybe you're even in an apartment or something like that, yeah. it's so much easier to do vermicomposting because it's oh, yeah. the worms don't really mess that up. For sure. They make it really easy. Uh, one of the big things that I realized though, is like um, a lot of people want to compost all their food scraps and they want to put it all through, you know, this little worm bin and maybe it's not the, the most practical situation to uh, compost all your food scraps, especially for a family. Like you really don't want to overdo a small indoor worm bin. You want to kind of leave space for them to do their thing. And then maybe, you know, half of it or a little bit over half, you put your, your food scraps in 
and sometimes you know it's full and you have more food scraps and it's like i don't really have anywhere to to put this and so like that's where i started you know just an outdoor compost pile uh in my backyard because i could but you know like some people don't have access to that but i think you know composting in a worm bin indoors is going to give you great compost um that you can use on your garden or whatever and it's going to reduce a lot of your waste or some of your waste you know but it might not be you know big enough of a, a solution to compost everything that you want to it does seem like the the biofilm that is left for worm castings just improves everything for whether i'm, I'm growing plants you're growing you know cannabis plants to whether it's, it's a tomato plant or you're just trying to build other things like with worm farming, getting things to, to reproduce. And then I've, I'm personally taking those and then building like isopod farms and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it seems like using the worm castings allows me to have a one up on my competition. Uh, just being able to have that, that soil life already there where um, if you, if no diss to the, the reptile world, but they call things live and active and stuff like that. And it's very obviously far from that. For sure. Uh, so I feel like the more that we understand organic matter and the more that we understand things need to be broken down. I know that you were talking about that you like to add a lot more carbon sources. And that's as I started to learn this from Dr. Elaine Ingham, it seemed like carbon was basically the currency of the soil food web. And so the more carbon that we have, the more money we got, you know, bling, bling time, everybody's doing well <laughs> for themselves. And we see a lot of exchanges going on. Uh, yeah, do man. you feel like that is kind of a uh, a, a decent analogy for what's going on for people that might not even understand what soil food web is yet. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, I think like a lot of these long-term carbon sources, like our, our big chips of, of wood chips, um, that some of them last the whole entire process and they're never fully broken down and they get sifted out and added to the new one. Um, and eventually they'll break down a little bit more. But uh, I think they become like batteries, you know, they eventually are entirely coated in this worm castings and like that itself, like the worm castings hold a high uh, EC, you know, they got that con conductivity and they can actually like uh, other nutrients can bind to the castings. And so now you have these wood chips that are totally soaked in water and these worm castings and they hold a charge and like, they're seriously just like these batteries that you know, are doing their thing in there. And uh, carbon is, I mean, it's all essential. You need the carbon to ri nitrogen ratio. You don't want to overdo either or, but uh, yeah, I, I think a diversity of carbon sources and sizes of those carbon sources are vital. You know, uh, some small ones are going to be digested a lot faster. Um, they're going to speed things up, but they're not going to be a long-term carbon source. And so like, I think it's beneficial to have some bigger chunks in there as well. I don't know if that answered or if Leighton, you want to add anything? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll definitely chime in on that one. Um, I think that uh, carbon is kind of uh, a lot more complicated than, than we're attributing to it. Um, yeah, for real. Well, we all know CO2, right? Well, that's a source of carbon. Um, we now finally understand that plant exudates or secondary tertiary metabolites are actually carbon sources. Mm -hmm. So carbon is, is all over the map, but yes, Brian, that is the currency that drives the soil life. And so <clears throat> um, understanding that there are many different types of carbon is just as critical um, as understanding the greens to browns or carbon to nitrogen ratio. And, you know, there's a lot of materials like like the spent mushroom blocks, right? They're they're a net neutral uh, yeah. distiller's waste, net neutral. Yeah, it'll heat it up if they use too much of it or it'll shut it down if you use too much of it. So it's yeah. it's complicated and, and it's not something that we can just, you know, mildly throw around that term um, because it's it's kind of like compost. What For real. <laughs> yeah. And then you got people calling their food scraps compost just to right. further, you know, so uh, that's not compost, it's food scraps that you're going right. to compost, you know. So. It's going to eventually turn into nitrogen because yeah. right now it's in a, or eventually turn into a carbon source or, or gas off as an ammonia or, or 
an other nitrogen source or get chewed up by biology in a different process. So, and, and backing it up, I really loved what you suggested about, you know, understanding food scraps. Like, yeah, you can overdo it on the worms and turn the whole yeah. thing into an anaerobic soup. Absolutely. So you really, again, it's low and slow as you feed and learn how to balance that ratio of bedding to food sources. Uh, in yep. your in your worm bins and you know again i love the idea of throwing it outside you know build a build a cage and put all your food scraps in one place you'll probably bring in pests you'll probably get you know the food pile will get disturbed which yeah. isn't the end of the world right no. you know all of these guys need you know need to be performing you know in a in a larger macro scale of, of the soil food web so Absolutely. you're not doing anything negative now if you're if you're in a city and you're bringing in a bunch of rats, well, that's going to piss your neighbors off. So yeah. probably not a good idea. <laughs> got to be mindful. But yeah, yeah. You got to be mindful, right? Yeah. But, but if you, if you, you know, are, are responsible in handling your food waste, um, you can break them apart and use them for different things. A lot of these can be put in cages for birds. Yeah. Um, you know, some of it can be put in the ground, uh, you know, dig a little hole, bury it so that it doesn't get found by rats and right. bears and uh, raccoons so there are ways to deal with it it's just being responsible um in dealing with that food waste and you know that's the craziest thing about socal when i first uh crash landed here i saw these green bins I'm like what are these green bins for and people are like oh we, we put all of our you know yard waste in there and i'm like what why aren't you grinding it up why that's why are you bag mowing bag mowing what the fuck you, why would you mow your grass and put it in a bag we're, you know, use a mulch mower, put it right back on the soil. And, and when you prune your trees, why aren't you chipping that up and throwing it around the base of the tree? That's what the fucking tree needs. Instead, you're spraying blue green fertilizers everywhere. What the fuck's wrong with you people? And then and now I'm dealing with with gum. <laughs> Millions of yards of this shit. Yeah. And so, oh, you know, the, the practices, the humans practices are what needs to change. Yeah. And the things that you're doing and the things that I'm doing and Brian is doing, bringing awareness to this is, is really the important thing. Um, you know, Absolutely. so that people can start thinking about it. And yeah, I, Sarah, I love the chickens, man. We should all have chickens, just no roosters because you piss your neighbors off. But there's no <laughs> reason why you can't put a couple chickens in a cage in your backyard. You know, and then chickens are great composting tools. Oh, they'll shred everything off, they'll add their manure. Things amazing. are just better. Like, right. Yeah. And then you can take their bedding, and that's another wonderful source of natural fertilizers. That's so, you know, again, closing the loops and, and biomimicking natural processes are the only way we're going to get out of this. Um, 100%, man. Uh-oh, we lost Brian. Uh-oh. But, yeah. Brian, um, anyway, we'll keep going. Yeah, let's keep it going. Uh, when we have some of these, like, educational classes, uh, the – one that's standing out to me right now is we were teaching a bunch of kids, but there was like their chaperones there, some of their parents. And like, you could really tell that it hit them the hardest, but I was like, yeah, people send away their leaves every year. You know, they act like it's a mistake that the trees are dropping their leaves. And it's like, no, these trees are trying to feed themselves and build soil. And like, you could just see like light bulbs, you know, across the room and, and the kids and the parents. And they're like, Oh my gosh, like, and they just never consider that because it, it's not the so societal norm, you know, like we're so used to a clean garden or a clean yard that has no organic matter on it. And that's so far away from the net system and what needs to happen. It's like we're depleting topsoil crazy fast and the, everybody's a part of it unless they're leaving it there and, and mulching it there or composting it there and then top dressing that compost, you know, it's like something yeah. that just another example of the education people yeah, they do I, I think unfortunately we've been programmed that everything yeah. has to be neat and we have to make nature tidy and in reality nature is very chaotic and messy but that's how she survives that's how yeah. we've had this planet go from a molten rock to the most incredible diverse garden of eden that we can't even possibly comprehend how beautiful yeah. it was 500 a thousand years ago you know how how just amazingly diverse this planet actually was yeah um and you're spot on man i mean like leaves the word means leave right? yeah leave come on 
right? Damn. And, and the other side of that that people don't understand is the endophytic fungi and bacteria that live in those leaves yep. go through another phase like insects where they become saprobes or yep. composters or decomposers. And they start to break that down and release that food that the plant put all of that ADP energy into pulling nutrients out of the soil growing and then dropping back down to feed itself and we're taking it away <laughs> for real man the we, of humanity chandler are you my mind are you adding beneficials are there certain things like have you kind of messed around with rove beetles or anything that so the, like? they're there naturally in like big numbers like again it's like almost so a, 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 allowing it to scoop. touch the ground is kind of your secret as well as you're building it but then also mother nature is kind of yeah. really taking hold for build it and they will come you know yeah. it's, it's the greatest example and like there's actually two different types of rove beetles in there and right. one of them is like probably five times the size of the other it's like a big one and then there's like the small ones that i, I was used to for the longest time you know but uh I, I see so much diversity in there and i'm constantly uh hitting up matt uh since since angel yeah. uh, sh shout out to matthew um because like he helps me identify stuff all the time and i'm constantly trying to id stuff but there's like pseudo scorpions i don't know if you've ever seen those mm -hmm. but those things are are badass and uh all sorts of, of beneficial mites and there's a war going on in every handful and like what are you just, naturally seeing uh, occur there you know rove beetles are you like does like the assassin bug naturally show up there or some of the I haven't other ones seen I've too found? many. No, I haven't seen too many assassin bugs. Um, mainly a lot of rove beetles, springtails, pill bugs, um, the pseudo scorpions, a slew of, of beneficial mites, shredders and predators. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving some, some people out, but yeah, there's a, there's so much more to it. And then like, so it's not just worm castings, it's also pill bug frass, you know, and like all this other stuff. It's like, it, it's a beautiful product. It really is. It, yeah, it, it sounds bio-complete, <laughs> right? Yeah, bio -complete. I actually uh, reached out to Elaine about that and whether she trademarked that. And her crew, uh, unfortunately, did trademark it. Okay. Um, but I've, I've begged her to let me into the back door um, so that I'm not required to go through all of the classes to be able to use the term. Okay. Because I said, look, it's important that we, we classify. It's important that we start to, to put names to things that we can trust. Yeah. And, you know, people need to understand that, that biocomplete compost is just that, like, like what your, your material. It's, it's got all of these other things in it, yeah. far beyond just protozoa, nematodes, and bacteria. Yeah. It's got the frasses, it's got the predatory mites, it's got, you know, the whole, the basis, the foundation of the soil food web. Yeah. And, you know, so I'll keep working on her you know, behind the scenes to hopefully get a way to um, skirt the educational part, but still be able to use the term yeah. responsibly because we've got, we need a name. We, we need Absolutely. A name. It so, sums it up perfectly. Biocomplete. That's what does. we're looking for. Yep. And, you know, it's funny. We we chopped that up oh, fucking years ago about, like, <laughs> well, compost is a catch-all. And, and you know, people look at compost as stinky, nasty-smelling stuff when, in reality, if it's made right, you smell it. It smells like this forest soil. My right? Smell, so, yeah, you know, how, how do you break that stigma? And, and so, finally, you know, 10 years later... Um, her and her crew have come up with a, a term that I, I can get behind. I, I yeah. believe that is, like you said, a, a word that is descriptive of what it is that this material actually is. For sure. So, and so Biocomplete was uh, newer to me. I haven't heard that until maybe sometime this year. Um, yeah. yeah. But we've been using the term biointelligent. You know, we have biologically intelligent soil and people are like what soil's intelligent and like we go to like the farmer's market and like i don't know most people aren't there to to buy compost but i start conversations all the time and just like you know i feel like i change people's outlook a, a lot and that like they never considered this type of stuff and like yeah soil's intelligent like 
yeah. it doesn't it doesn't need to have a brain like our our human conception of intelligence you know like we just think of animals that look like humans you know like the next smartest thing is, is like chimpanzees and apes and stuff and then like we go off of brain size and stuff it's like uh intelligence doesn't need to have a, a brain then uh mycelium or like fungi and amoeba uh the slime molds are the perfect example of that like you're still muted Layton. Uh, yeah, you know, I first heard the term. Um, hey, real, real quick, let's address that. What kind of bracelet are you wearing right there? This bracelet? Oh. Hey. All That's right. a wheat doll, uh, beaded bracelet, uh, handmade. Um, That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's it's protection. Uh, it's to help. Um, it was for his birthday on Monday. <laughs> oh, sweet, dude. Oh, happy hey, birthday. Happy birthday, bro. Yeah, she's all about trying to protect me because I am in you know a lot of public spaces and uh, I am an empath, so therefore I take on the energy around me. Um, but anyway, so that's that's what that's all about. Uh, I I had one for five years. It snapped just prior to COVID, and you know, that just changed all of our directions, and and therefore I hadn't been able to circle back. But now that I'm back out in the world doing the work. Uh, she felt it was important to get me uh, some more protection. So that's that's what that bracelet's all about. Awesome. Um, so the first time I ever heard uh, biointelligence was actually used by uh, Dragonfly Earth Medicine. Shout yeah. out to Josh and Kelly. Absolutely. Um, and, and it was used both in the terms of the soil as well as biointelligence seeds. Which yes. you know is really important to understand that if your seeds are grown in a biologically intelligent soil, if you introduce them to synthetic fertilizers, they're not going to do well. No, nope. and vice versa. If you take yep. a synthetically grown cultivar that has been, uh, you know, bred out or, or uh, how do I say that? Uh, yeah, bred in, in a synthetic system and you throw it in a really good biocomplete or biointelligent soil system, you're again, you're not going to get the potential of that plant to express. You're going 100%. to have to let it get, uh, build up its, its own intelligence or ability to, to communicate with the intelligent environment in which you've tossed it into. So, you know, that's Absolutely. again, great, great ways of, of using words to, to educate people as to what you're really talking about. Yep. Um, soil is not just soil. It's, it's intelligent. It has life to it. I mean, God, I remember people, I, I told them, Oh, your soil's alive. I'm like, what? No, it's just dirt, man. It's just dirt. You know, it's like, no <laughs> healthy system. There's so much going on. It's yeah. not fun. fungi oh, are like the best great. example of biochemical engineers, you know, and bacteria are, are a close second. And like, they're constantly problem solving and, uh, evaluating their surroundings, you know, and uh, adjusting. And uh, I'm really glad you talked about the bio-intelligent seeds because when you talked about like a C-section versus a, a vaginal birth, like that's the same thing as like, it's that initial inoculation that is going to, you know, set things in the right path right from the get-go, you know? So like a baby is inoculated going through uh, the vagina or whatever. So like, uh, and seeds, they're, encoded with these endophytes um, that are literally, you know, it's living bacteria and fungi on the the surface of the seed and inside the seed, you know? And so like it's plants that are bred in these biologically intelligent systems, they have that initial inoculation. You don't need to inoculate it. Like you still should, but like it, it's already got something that is going to help benefit it. And so like one of my greatest realizations, you know, is like, everybody breeds some accidental seeds, you know, from time to time, uh, something herms over and like taking those seeds because they're the healthiest seeds I've ever seen, you know, like I, I bred them on accident, but like they look better than any pack I've ever bought, like beautiful, rich tiger stripes and everything. It's like, that looks like a seed that I should pop, you know, and like you pop that seed that was bred in that soil back into that same soil and like things just take off like no other and like that's how you can get these plants to tap into their epigenetic state and like um express themselves based off of their environment instead of being entirely limited by you know their, their surroundings and like oh that so was that was so well put my friend and and you're spot on because that that 
plant lived in that environment and in that soil. And when mm -hmm. it bred out, it bred a, a replicate, a replicate of exactly what would be best uh, in yep. that environment. Um, yep. You know, and, and a, another uh, little interesting thing um, that I've learned over the years is if you take your seed and you suck on it yep. before you plant it, now you're imprinting your bio intelligence on that seed. Yes. The seed is now going to know what you need it to or how it should express itself to give you what you need. From exactly. That. I love that. Yeah, and that's, that's the type of stuff that I think some people are like, oh, that, that's bro science or like, but like, I think like the spiritual aspect or like this, uh, you know, this imaginative imagination, you know, like it's such a, a vital part of all of this. And like intention is everything. It's like, if you can put the intention into your seeds by like, you know, doing that type of stuff, it's like, that shit is incredible. And yeah. Here we go, Brian, down yeah. the woo woo hole. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, and I, I'm like I said, man, I'm man. fine with it. I, I there's Absolutely. so much uh ancient ancient knowledge, wisdom, whatever you want to call it, that that speaks on a variety of things that we just you know, I feel like Leighton and I dip our toe in some of these topics and then everybody comes at us like this is fucking bullshit. You know, like, <laughs> immediately without even checking it out. Yeah. Um, and I get that. I get I get that some people are just one way of thinking. Some people are the other. Exactly. I just try to um, go where the information is and, and try to also remember where your sources are coming from. But mm -hmm. um, just cultivating plants in general, like like we are getting that. And you had mentioned the brain. I feel like when you are cultivating cannabis using um, the soil food web focused on composting worms that does almost become like that second stomach if you will and and oh, yeah. science and data for that and for you, those of you out there they really are starting to say that like there is almost like a second brain in your gut and how important gut health is to overall sleep and the melatonin and stuff that's built throughout the day i personally had the aha moment uh, when I was trying to build up the living soil systems, uh, being successful, but not at the same level with praying leaves and all the kind of like Instagram type photos that you want to show off until I started to, to mess around with uh, basically kefir or the, you know, the yeah. beginning of what I, you know, you later find out is lab, but I didn't understand any of that. And I just was drizzling uh, kefir around my plants and I just saw the overall health just take off the overall oh, yeah. color of the composting worms went from like a pinkish color to this dark, rich purple. And nice. that's when I really started to see my plants take off. Uh, and that's why I'm so huge. And I know you are as well, Chandler and Layton is, um, just understanding that soil food web is a, is a basic way. And, and, I almost don't feel like, you know, if you're newer to cannabis farming, I'm sure a, a lot of it feels like you're way behind on the knowledge scale. Uh, but yeah. understanding Mother Nature, I feel like is going to allow you to to speed up that process. And if you continue to stay hungry and watch these kind of shows and watch other shows and really see a diverse, you know, we talk about diverse um, microbes and that kind of stuff. Leighton and I are also huge on diverse education, like take take stuff from a variety of people. I think you can learn from people that you might not necessarily even agree with. But some yeah. of the points that they made, or I've never really thought of it that way before, uh, I feel like is is healthy discussion. And that's something that I feel like is, is great about the living soil crowd, uh, in my opinion, is because it's really none of us are doing this shit. We're just trying to figure out and manage mother nature and the 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 guys and the girls that understand this on a yep. top tier level, uh, I feel like just really understand the way mother nature flows. And maybe they know a certain few ways and tips and tricks throughout the years uh, on ways to build up those soil systems. Uh, but the guys that I shout out all the time, I feel like if you ever have the chance to see their farms or check out their, their Instagram pages, uh, there's a reason why those guys are top tier and, and girls are top tiers because they understand this. And once you understand that, now you can kind of almost play with Mother Nature in a little bit, mess around with different uh, tea formulas and stuff. I know like we, we got really big into the sprouted seed teas oh, yeah. uh, and then we would dump that on top of of the kefir. And then, you know, at night, the worms would obviously come up and just take yeah. that. But they yeah, love so that. I'm excited that this is now kind of created a, a job for yourself as a, as a passion. And now it seems like you've been rocking this from what I don't understand a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, working for Wormies and. Yeah, super um, fortunate that uh, find the, the paths that I did for sure. But uh, I wanted to touch on that and how important this education aspect is and how important it is to like read the books and to watch these channels and everything. But like also you got to get out there and just do it. You know, you, you got to experiment for yourself. You got to try growing your own plants. But like also just go out to the woods and 
find a spot of plants that are thriving there without man touching it without anything and just sit there for a while and be quiet and like really put on this lens of like why are you thriving here like like what how have you evolved for like millions of years to like you know just do your thing out here without without man and like you can study every aspect of the plant and like josh and kelly taught me this but like we separate the plant from the soil from the air from the water and like it's all so intertwined and so interconnected. And you talked about this earlier, of like bacteria inside a fungi. It's like, there could be a virus inside of that bacteria and a virus inside of that other virus. And like things are constantly going smaller down and like, I don't know, we, we don't really know what's going on. Things are, are crazy intertwined, but uh, I think. No, I'm glad you brought up virus. So yeah. uh, part of the study group, we, we really went down the viral hole and it's very clear in present day science that every bacteria has viruses in it. <clears throat> and those viruses are literally what steered all evolution. Yeah. Nothing would be here without them. And we, we hate them and we, we just look down on them and we fight them. But in reality, they're just doing their job. And, yeah. you know, regardless of how long we've been here and how long we get to live here yeah. uh, to be determined, um, but they will always be steering evolution in on all levels from the single cell organism all the way to the, you know, mega elephant whale. So I'm glad you said that. And, and another thing that I think the audience has really got to learn about is doing just that forest bathing, yeah. walking into a quiet space in the woods, um, quieting your mind, which is the hardest thing to do. And this takes practice. You need to practice um, breathing techniques, or um, you can walk. There's, there's, there's all kinds of ways to meditate. Yeah. But the key to meditation is to quiet the brain, yeah. stop the brain from from racing. Oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. I'm worried about this. Worried about that. Shut all of that out, and then observe. And through that observation, you can learn so much more, almost, than you can from reading a book. Absolutely. So, you know, and, and you, you, again, thank you for touching that because that's not something that we talk about as a society or as a species about how important it is to quiet your mind and for real. talk to you. Um, you know, cause Brian and I have talked about, you know, connecting with your plants and the importance of spirituality. And yet, you know, I think most people just don't get that connection. They, they're, oh, this is a job. I'm here to do my work, yeah. earn a paycheck. And in reality, no. This existence that you are is an experience and you are a sum total of all of your experiences. So are you a, are you a good experience or are you a bad experience? Yeah. And what are you doing? How are you helping the situation? Are you a taker or are you a giver or are you an educator? What, what are you? And, mm -hmm. and are you in balance? Are you yin and yang or, or are you just one or the other? And yeah. I think that, you know, meditation will help all of us understand our position and maybe enlighten us to in a way that we will be more responsible with what we were gift, gifted this this life exactly. uh, and you know but you're never going to get there you're never going to get to that higher level of vibration or understanding unless you learn the very basics of understanding meditation and observation and and quieting your monkey mind from all of the chatter <laughs> from shit like this yes know? So Absolutely. And I so I live in the oh man. A little bit of a connection issue there. We all good? Did I drop out? No, I just lag sometimes. Okay. Like, we're all good now. Um yeah. No but yeah, humans are telepathic and we're constantly putting off energy, you know, and like somebody can walk into the room and you can feel that energy change without them saying anything, you know. It's like we're constantly putting off this energy we're sending out these frequencies and so like you get into a populated city and everybody's all oh i gotta do this i gotta do that they're drinking their iced coffee they're hitting their nicotine stick they're on that fl flight or flight you know that the sympathetic nervous system and uh you know they're uh they're putting out some pretty wild vibes and so you end up sitting in traffic and i've experienced what i call thought pollution you know it's like there's just so much going on so much vibrations like 
I got to go out to the woods and like, I got to get away from that thought pollution. And like, you think differently, like when you can go out to this area that nobody's been to in a while, or, you know, like you can go sit by yourself in, in the quiet of the woods. Like I've had so many, uh, insights and inspirations like hit me when I meditate in, in, in an environment like that without any thought pollution. Um, but then, yeah, this spiritual side of everything and like, uh, the self work and everything is so important. And we focus a lot about this at the compost cup because like we can do everything we can to, you know, remediate our soils and, uh, prevent diversity loss. But like the core of all of this problem is like greed and like, it's a, it's a human issue, you know, that we can, like, if we, we practice these mindfulness med and practices and, and meditations like that's how we we actually change our soils by like changing ourselves and becoming more compassionate and everything and so it's another like mushrooms are so cool mushrooms are like and they're they the great help. connectors you know and, and the soil between death and life and like they're they're responsible for that rebirth but like they also connect us to the spiritual realm and like Take some mushrooms, everybody. Like, let's. Uh, yeah, let's, we've let's we've talked it. about that on the show, and and you're right. You know, um, mindfulness, um, gratefulness is something yep. that is lost in in our society. And you're obviously wise beyond your years. Um, you're clearly an empath, and you get it. I mean, if I, I get around people, and if they're negative, I, I got to get out of there. You yep. know, I can feel. I can totally feel all of their energy and and that again that's why this and, yeah. and some of the other things that i wear is to you know is because i am too too empathic um and i don't think that people are in touch with that side of themselves like you know you ever notice like when you're driving down the highway and there's some aggressive driver goes flying by and then all of a sudden five other ones join in and they're all yeah. around all over the place that is that energy that's that energy you if you are negative you will attract negative energy if you're extremely positive you'll attract positive energy and or opposites attract too yep. so you have to be very careful because a lot of really positive good people attract a lot of negative people yep. so there's that balance of learning to protect yourself understand those things understand the energies when it come in i had a conversation with my daughter just last night about this and and that I'm like, honey, you, uh, you know, you're an empath, you understand that, but you, you don't do any of the work necessary yeah. to handle that responsibility. You're going to blow yourself up if you're not careful because you just give, give, give. And, and when you're around people that are all negative and cause she explained this situation where she was trying to handle three kids, a, a, you know, a, a husband and you know, not her kids, but just someone else. Okay. And, and she took on all the energy of those kids, you know, I'm hungry. I need this. I need that. And, and it's like, she went home and broke down into tears. Yeah. And I'm like, no, you, you have to start practicing these things. You have to, you, you're aware, but yeah. you're not learning. And, and that learning part is, is the most important. Part. Exactly. And that's what emotions are there for. They're our, our tools and our teachers. And like, if you're going to be mindful enough to see that we're getting irritated or that, some emotion is rising it's like you can further look at that emotion and learn a whole lot about yourself you know and then like learn these these practices of what we can do to prevent that emotion from rising it's like and causing uh, other people to have that emotion, yeah right because you can start a wave you can start a tsunami just as quickly as you can get run over by one so yeah. you know yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up in mushrooms i mean uh <laughs> Brian's talked about like doing a mushroom show. <laughs> yeah, we're here for it. We're gonna eat live on the air. Oh yeah. shit! <laughs> we'll see what we talk I think about. A good yeah, idea. man, be I interesting. Think it's a good idea and a bad idea. At the same time. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Uh, yeah. um, but like another one marathon. of the time. Sorry, you have something. Oh, I always call it a mental marathon. Like you and <laughs> hanging out, especially for if you do a, like a heroic dose. That'd be exhausting it'd be hard to sit i think it'd be pretty hard to sit here for three hours on a heroic yeah dose. for real man i took <laughs> pretty damn close back. to a heroic dose at the chicago museum of natural history oh and wow i absorbed everything that we know about mankind and the world and like in the like the most beautiful displays of sound and vision and everything it's like the most meaningful thing I, I think i've ever done was you know tripping there and shit was that was awesome. 
and like you see mushrooms all around that place and there's a psilocybin exhibit and everything and everything just clicked that was like this is exactly what i'm supposed to be doing you know like right here and like mushrooms are the best way to fully experience like anything if you ever seen a mush or a movie you know on the right dose of, of mushrooms like you can notice every single detail and like i think you can fully experience the, the, the picture that is trying to be conveyed or like i don't know who knows but mushrooms are cool um, yeah, you're spot on dude yeah. it, it opens so many neural pathways yeah all at the same time that you are now superhuman you're absorbing on a level that you couldn't without yeah. help and so that's that's what makes them you know part of uh, the indigenous culture and and yeah. you know in that greater understanding of what was going on around them um, and in their, you know, religious practices and, and their ceremonies. Um, and it heightened their awareness and their respect and their gratefulness for nature. Yep. And they weren't afraid to die. They weren't afraid to live. Like, I know so many people that are afraid to live. And I know so many people that are yes. afraid to die. And it's like, you, you're missing the whole fucking point. You know, those are the people that need to have microdosed or supervised yep. hero doses but it would change their whole trajectory yeah. if they did it. And, and, you know, unfortunately the control of greed and power has taken these tools away from us yeah. and suppressed it to the point where, you know, I was listening to the, the Columbus day, you know, and, and the acknowledgement of indigenous day. It's like Columbus was a freaking, a savage man. They, 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 killed, maimed, destroyed, imprisoned, enslaved, every culture that they came in contact with. And we and we celebrate this guy and he and the Catholic Church and, and the shit they did. You know, it, it's it's scary. And and so we need to respect the indigenous and the culture and, and the information. Um, we need to we need to somehow gain some of that back. And I believe you know some of these plants, cannabis mushrooms um and there's dmts those are what yeah. will bring awareness and hopefully balance back to humanity because fucking we're on a bullet train to hell right now and if we don't make some serious sacrifices and changes then yeah there's a one-way street man we're on a rails there's no stopping it i so. couldn't agree more <clears throat> um one thing about like the energies that we're talking about it's like a huge part of my IPM strategy. I think like IPM starts at the door, you know, like obviously you don't want to be bringing in pests on your clothing or anything, but like you really don't want to be bringing in bad vibes into your garden at all. And so like before I go in there, you know, I, I do a vibe check and like I got my meditation or the, like my singing bowl, you know, and like, uh, or like you do anything, but like it's just another mindfulness practice of making sure that you're really not bringing in your stress and your, your bad intentions into your garden and like, if you ever water like when you're in a hurry and like you're just like shit i gotta go and like you're putting all that stress like you're, you're literally watering that stress into your plants and stuff it's like I, I believe that like there's energy exchange on every level and like we need to be putting out some good vibes when we're in our garden and uh being intuitive and paying attention to what they're saying to us and you, Ryan, you simply, how many times have we talked about that <laughs> Yeah, we uh, we even, yeah, we had a uh, discussion kind of about this yesterday as well with Marco uh, and Belief. So shout out to those guys, where the uh, Belief was saying that he didn't uh, even allow his crews to listen to like um, basically like negative type music. Yeah. So he's dialed in. I don't want to blast a genre, but you, you kind of know what. Like, yeah. Uh, so, some people want to listen to certain things, myself included. I'm, I grew up in Atlanta, and there's just certain things about certain music that I will always love till the day I die. I don't know why, but that's just how it is, negative or not. But I understand yeah. that, like, you know, if you're if you're listening to that shit day in, day out, and that's all you're doing, and that's all your kind of your entire vibe is at your company, I can understand why, um, in my opinion, Belief is crushing it with some of his, you know, the genetics that he has and stuff is just next level i don't know if you've seen his work Layton, but uh the guy's just on another level with understanding and, and taking the time to understand his work um I, I feel like uh if he was able to continue to improve the process and maybe uh get onto the living soil uh that would just be on a on a whole nother level because i feel like there's guys out there that you know, 30 plus years that have been farming this way 
uh, understand things. They they themselves are even saying like, all right, the, the microbial world is what's bringing that full genetic profile, that full expression that all of us yeah. have been after. It's just we didn't have the knowledge or it's hard to get off when you are on certain rails and you're just crushing it in your business. Um, you know, in, in a way, why would you change things up? Uh, so I understand, especially for a lot of the old heads, even I'm talking to some of those guys that I know watch the show that have refused to come on the show because uh, they don't grow with the living soil. And I, I look, I get that part, but I still feel like uh, if you've been farming for 30 years plus, as Chandler mentioned, doing anything with experience, uh, there's a lot to learn. Um, and, and I feel like if you want to farm cannabis, worm farming has got to be at the top of the list of things that you need to understand. Uh, if you want to grow these elite cannabis strains and find those full genetic profiles that are really going to uh, allow your work to stand out. Otherwise, you know, there really is that separation. And in my opinion, it is the soil food web uh, or really high education on farming cannabis where it goes from good to great. And that little those little percentage points where it really gets to that excellent cannabis, you can see on the photos uh, like when you're scrolling through. There's great cannabis everywhere, but there's certain brands and certain growers that really stand out when you kind of like going through that and you stop and pause and you're like, damn, that is, uh, you know, I, I don't want to shout out too many people and stuff because I don't want to, I feel like some people feel left out, but uh, Green Source Gardens, you know, there, there's just certain people out there where I'm like, Jesus, man, this is, I can't imagine just the colors that some of these guys are getting and, and just the overall process and the way and things are dialed in. That's only what you can see, Brian. Oh, exactly. You, you, you try smoking some of his stuff. Whoo. <laughs> you talk about next level. Yeah. yeah. Nick and his wife are great people. And, and they've been putting out a lot of Kent content for a lot of years, just like Dragonfly. I mean, yeah. and those are, those are the bars that we should all strive for. And, and yeah. you know, your comment about <clears throat> the fact that they're not going to hit that potential. I mean, why wouldn't you want to hit the full potential, the, the best expression that genetic can provide? Yeah. Without living soils, you're never going to get there. You're not going to even get close. So thanks. Or you got to educate yourself to the botanist level, because I, I do feel like there are certain people out there that have that. Um, but it's very far. It, very few people, I feel like, are on that elite level where uh, I've been confused in my own where it's like, you know, I wasn't sure if it was a living soil or, or something else. Uh, sometimes they can get those soil. smells. Just soil in general. I feel yeah, like what the hell is do. soil? There's no sand silter clay in here. This is a, a biologically driven, modified growing medium. This ain't <laughs> living soil. Hey, you talk about marketing. <laughs> yeah, for real. Oh, those dude, when I first heard they were talking, calling super soils living soils, I'm like, you're not even close. I don't think, yeah. especially at the beginning, I don't think nobody knew really what we were saying. You know, because yeah. we'd be like, all right, so you, what do you mean you're cooking your soil? Oh, I'm using the super soil, you know, where it just kind of like sits in the big garbage can for a while. And it, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people definitely dismiss that. So shout out to all the pioneers that were cooking their soil, yeah. uh, following ideas. that they. I mean, we were putting it in a little uh, kiddie pool back in the day and like yeah. mixing it around and covering it up with tarp. And, uh, and again, having really no like idea it. what we were doing. But then yeah. all of a sudden the, you know life started to emerge and we're like all right uh i have no idea what the fuck we're doing but this is starting to pay you know seems to be paying off from the the forums and then that's when i feel like a lot of stuff really started to take off like after a few years of trying to mess around with this a little some of the youtube channels started to pop up uh, more and more people were willing to show what they were doing on instagram and then it, yeah. i feel like everything with cannabis exploded just from growing to um you know, the especially here in Colorado, I mean, there's people here with rigs that are like a hundred thousand dollars that they pass around at these parties and they only smoke the best of the best of the best. And I mean, it just completely went from, hey, I'm just trying to get good weed to just everything so bougie. And I, um, yeah. that part I, I don't really like, but I, I am a, a huge fan that more and more people are smoking cannabis for. Uh, whether they're just trying to relax at the end of the day or actually for ailments and, and just life altering things that improve their life in general. Um, I would like uh, Leighton, if we could, uh, there's a couple of people I'd like to reach out to where we could talk maybe more about the, the endocannabinoid system as far as like yeah. a health thing. And I know that you and your, um, I was about to say wife, I know I, you and Pauline uh, are, um, you know, understand that on a whole nother level. So maybe we could talk to her, you know, off offline and, uh, figure something out but i don't think enough people understand including 
like you had mentioned, the medical doctors of how important it seems like the endocannabinoid system is. And, uh, you know, when my son would suffer from seizures and stuff and we found out that CBD is a way to, to fix that, nobody was talking about that. Um, you know, so there's just so many things I feel it's like. It's crazy, Brian, that the, <clears throat> the fact that the endocannabinoid system regulates your entire body. It's everything. So every single process and function is regulated by the endocannabinoid system and medical industry doesn't even acknowledge it. They, Yo, they, I've they, talked they, to so many doctors that like, they have no idea that this master regular master regulatory system, like even exists. Like it's, it's the one that's in charge of all the other systems. And they're not taught about that in medical school. And that's like everything yeah. you need to know that like, they don't care about making us healthy. Like they're, they have their agenda, you know, like it's, Profits, profits, profits. <laughs> to be clear, these are MDs we're talking about because I know yeah. there's a lot of people that, but actual MDs yeah. that have no yeah. idea. And that's Medical. the part that is kind of in a way almost creepy. And you know, why would up. they be teaching that? And you know, why don't we talk about the immune system in a variety of ways, whether yeah. it's with current situations or before? Like it just seemed like those those things weren't, weren't taught. And not, you know, when I, I grew up in the South and I can assure you, nobody was teaching us that food was health. You know, we our green beans had lard and bacon in it, you know, and that was uh, literally my family called that a vegetable. So I, I feel like there's a there's just a huge learning curve with maybe how you're growing up on what is nutrition, uh, yeah. you know, the difference between actual like water and, and you know, Dasani or something like that. You know, mountain water, El Dorado mountain water yeah. here in Colorado is drastically different than Dasani water. But I don't feel like a lot of people believe that or would see that. Yeah. Um, you know, Brian, I wanted to touch on something and, and just reel the audience back in and talk about um, the endocannabinoid system for a minute. So <clears throat> back in the uh, early 1900s, um, DuPont came around and wanted to sell uh, the U.S. Navy rope um, because basically that whole shipping industry was controlled by hemp, hemp rope. And so they created this toxic nylon rope with all kinds of waste. <clears throat> because they had money and they wanted to take over the industry. So they convinced the Navy um, that they would give them the rope for, for short money. Um, but in return, um, they had to banish uh, hemp production in, in the country. And so they were able to accomplish this um, through politics, money and power. And so basically hemp farms were basically shut down left and right. And that was great. But then, you know, some of the farms kept growing it or because it was wild everywhere, um, we kept making hemp rope and, and, you know, DuPont in the traditional of Rockefeller is kill, not, not work nicely with your competition, but kill them, take them the fuck out so you don't have any competitors. So then they pushed another law through uh, in the United States of America. And that was that if any farmer was caught any hemp on its on its property that farm would be seized by the u.s government so what do you think the farmers did they burned every single plant they could find they eradicated that from the united states of america to protect their own interests to protect their livelihood and the consequences of that was that all of our animals were living on that wild yeah. livestock so feed they were living on that stuff. That was the food source for the whole soil food web. And guess what? For all the health of all those animals yep. and the health of the people that consumed those animals. So all of a sudden, the human race was starved of endocannabinoid health because the hemp plant was not being consumed by what we consumed. Can Scary thought. Scary Absolutely, man. I mean, and that's when the health decline began. Cancer started showing up. All kinds of diseases started showing up years later. And, and you know, so bottom line is that, you know, there are some doctors out there, MDs, that, that will talk about the endocannabinoid system. But for years, they've been banished and called quacks and, and not allowed to participate in the, the medical ivory fucking tower that's run by the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. And, you know, that's the scary shit. And now it's finally coming out and, and we're still we're still trying to regulate this plant, control this plant, let big money control the plant. 
Uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's the fucking problem. And, and hemp is no different than cannabis. They're the same fucking plant. Yeah. Those are and, government words. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fucking scary. So yeah, Brian, that's, that's what we're up against is, is trying to, you know, break the down the gates of the ivory tower and say enough is enough motherfucker. Yep. We'll warn you the first one through the gate always gets bloodied, man. <laughs> so here's yeah. sharpening our swords and shields and fucking attacking. Fuck yeah. Right at the same time that they took out uh, hemp from our diets and made us endocannabinoid deficient. Uh, they also patented all these petrochemical medicines and that's where like big pharma really got its hold, you know, and they, uh, they use that uh, power of the media to label all of these plant medicines that we've been using for thousands of years as alternative. And now they have these regular medicines, you know, like this, this new and improved medicine and now all these, all their plant medicines are alternative and like they're, they're put in the shadow or whatever. It's like all this is happening at the same time. And right around the same time that we started waging war on our soils and using, um, you know, byproducts of, of making bombs uh, to feed our, our plants synthetically. And uh, so like, we've just been waging war on so many different aspects all from around the same time. And like, that's what I'm talking about. Like things are accumulating really fast and there's a, there's so many health problems and everything happening now. And it but, all goes back to the soil. For real. That's it. Right there. Yep. Bam. This book right here is awesome uh, for the yeah. endocannabinoid system. The Holistic oh, Healing wow. Guide to Cannabis by Tammy Sweet. Yeah, there we go. Nice. Yep. Is it a pretty easy read? Yeah. There's a lot of uh, like charts and stuff in here, some nice visuals. But they, they break down the endocannabinoid system and, like, this here, like uh, the degradation of cannabinoids, and, like where it all comes from, from like the mother uh, CBD or CBGA and how that all breaks down. And then how uh, like these raw cannabinoids are uh, then decarboxylated or uh, oxidized or whatever. And they can change and evolve. And... Yeah, it's all about redox, oxidation and reduction. Yeah. Right. I know it's heady shit, but it's all related, you know, uh, definitely. And Brian, if you want me to chase uh, someone down to, to come on and talk about that, I will. Uh, I'll definitely I would love to learn more about redox. Yeah, I think. Well, yeah, well, redox a, a variety or, of things. And they're cannabinoid. Both. Yeah. Both, <laughs> yeah. Redox is a, a newer thing to me for sure. Are you familiar with the Matt Powers book, uh, Regenerative Soil? Uh, familiar I, with it I, I, matt powers has been pumping out some education dude that book oh, shout out to you. that might be like like out, out of all of these here it's like that might be the one that i recommend most it has like a little bit of everything in there and it's like really well written really well illustrated and stuff they got like a whole section on uh on redox potential and everything so yes redox, to to. redox is is deep <clears throat> uh, for real yeah Hussan, uh I forget his last name was the one that really kind of um, Olivier, Olivier, yeah. Yeah. Olivier yeah. Yeah. was the one that really kind of brought out or introduced something that we knew about for a long time. But again, it was the awakening of lost knowledge that yeah. he provided. That's um, so much of this. Yeah, he's he's on John Kemp's podcast, and I think you can uh, listen to it for free. Oh, but, sweet. Yeah, you got to put on your seatbelt and your fucking helmet. Yeah, it's it's a hard one to follow. So many of these, it's like I, I can't listen to these podcasts like even this one included like when i'm working like i, I gotta sit down with a notebook to like really you know fully get oh, the man, we were hoping that we were trying to dial it down because yeah some some of the real brilliant minded people uh for some some of us is that's a three or four time video kind of yeah, thing and constantly rewinding not everybody has time for that for sure for sure yeah and comprehending some of that upper level stuff it is hard for a lot of us and i think that's why again with the living soil systems uh the, the main um point of that i guess is to just trust the process yeah uh, because when you start farming with that you'll see with your own eyes you'll see the overall health of your plant start to improve yep. maybe we can't pronounce every single uh word that's going on in the the, the soil food web yep. uh, but you can see for yourself and i feel like as long as you trust the process continue to make sure that there's enough organic matter 
Uh, that's something else that I feel like a lot of people uh, talk about is when there's not enough organic matter, the, the worms can leave or um, are, are, is there certain kind of gold nuggets? I know you're familiar with the show that you could kind of give people, you know, at the level that you're continually worm farming. Are there certain consistencies and ways to improve things um, that, that would help us in the long run? So like, yeah, and our big old rows of worms, um, they don't run out of food source or anything. And like when they do, they kind of just migrate over. Um, they can sense like where the fresh stuff is. And so like we'll put a fresh pile right up touching the the finished pile so like you could see the worms kind of start to migrate over there but uh when we were talking about breeding too i wanted to mention this but like top dressing or like feeding your worms um organic matter on top like with the avocado tech or um like i said we grow a bunch of squash here um and pumpkins and melons and all that stuff is insane for them they love that nice moist um consistency and they, they they love the fats of the avocado and everything and so like when they come up and they eat all of that food and like you could amend it if you want to like with the avocado tech you can add some dry amendments but like they'll come up and they'll eat all that food and they have like a big like orgy pretty much like all these worms are rubbing against each other and they have both the eggs and the sperm on them and they end up creating these cocoons at the end and uh so like you have a huge baby boom and then all those worms disperse back through your soil or back through your compost and they released whatever they just ate. Um, so like you guys are familiar with the, the avocado tech in, in your soils, but basically just tossing anything right on top of your soil. It could even be like wet cardboard if that's all you have, but like we, we obviously recommend using something more nutritious than that. But uh, just putting something wet right on top of the soil, they're going to come up and they're going to have a, a big population boom. You know, yeah, I, wanted, also I wanted to touch on the organic matter a little bit, too, because this is something I don't think that most people get. In soil testing, um, there's two critical, three critical components that understand or that are what's called your cation exchange capacity. Okay. So that capacity means the ability to hold nutrients on the site, plant available, so when the plant wants it, it can exchange it for either another ionic form or grow out of bacteria that will consume that and make it plant available. So the higher the organic matter, um, the higher your exchange capacity, the more nutrients that can be held on and not lost through solubility. So in other words, they're not mobile. They won't wash out of the soil. Yeah. So organic matter is number one with the most exchange sites, both for anions and cations. Mm -hmm. Clay is number two. Um, it will hold some anions and some cations, or more, more cation than anion, and silt will hold anions. So with sand, or not, excuse me, sand, with silt, clay, and organic matter, now you can increase the amount of what we call nutrient capacity that that soil can hold on to. And where does those nutrients come from? The breaking down of all of these components by the right. <clears throat> Something interesting that you talked about up front um, in the beginning and said you, you talked about sand coming to, into your pile yeah. and you attributed it to the worms. Well, some of it, that is true, but okay. most of it is actually what's called mineralization or remineralization. Um, I saw Greens, shout out to Greens Goddess, said the same thing about hers, that she gets sand in her pile and doesn't you know understand where it's coming from. So bottom line is um, years back, I had a thousand gallon aquaculture system. The only thing that I would allow in there was a really good high grade fish food and water. And I collected the fish for us. Uh, I, I created a, um, a collection system to pull all of the suspended solids out of the water column so that yep. the water that went back into the uh, aquaculture tank was crystal clear. Yeah. And at the end of every five days, I would take that waste, which was the foundation of my product, um, and I would use it in a process of aerobic stabilization and introduction to compost and vermicastings, vermicompost. Um, and then I would uh, what's called soft collide that, and that was the product that I used to rehab soil. Well, interestingly enough, there was always sand on the bottom of that filter. And I huh. was where the hell is the sand coming from? So I called a buddy of mine, Dr. Kevin Fitzsimmons down at University of Arizona. And I said, hey, 
Kev, I, I don't understand what's going on here. I mean, the only thing I'm allowing in this system is water and fish food. And I don't believe there's a lot of sand in fish food because I've crushed it up and I couldn't find any grit or yeah. find any sand in it. Hmm. Because it's remineralization. So the biology is stealing different parts and components of these molecules. And it automatically forms a stronger bond on the electron. Uh, and so they suck together and they begin to form sand. Now, the sand is wild in minerals. Um, minerals that were lost through biological processes but that's the bottom line as to why you're getting grit and other that's people. so cool isn't that bad yeah thank you so much but, man yeah, a little gold nugget Brian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i was gonna say so that's kind of again another little thing of proof that the the process is working is when you do see that sand you know that things are really taking hold yeah. nice yeah very cool you're getting close to stasis yep. you know hell yeah man <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to go on that rant. Oh, that was great. And then improving things with like uh, with the worms. Are you adding any amendments like uh, extra calcium? Because I know I noticed when using avocado tech and then adding like drizzling calcium, especially coral calcium, seemed like that was on a whole nother level. So they would get the gumball effect that you had mentioned, like the gum orgy. Uh, to go deeper, worms are hermaphrodites. That's what he was getting at. So once yeah. they touch each other, uh, they they want to reproduce. And so if you're able to add a bunch of those little reproduction zones into your soil system, especially if you're using larger beds or if it's a smaller system, maybe you just need one avocado. Uh, the main thing that I want to preach on this, because I don't feel like a lot of people hear this part. The goal is to use avocados that your family ate, the shells, uh, if they go bad, which happens a lot of times, let's be yeah. honest, in a, and especially in a family, a larger family. So instead of throwing that away, going to the grocery stores and asking them, what do you do with your avocados? That kind of stuff. Uh, spending money on organic avocados just to put into your worm bin uh, is really the last thing that I would say, unless you're maybe in a city and you want to do this in an apartment. It's the and, only option you have. Or whatever, right. You know, like, hey, so you could negotiate things. To avocado where, tech is about the shell. Squash, pumpkin, all these other gourds yeah, can be used it's the same thing. You cut them in half and pack them full of minerals and, and fats and stuff like that. So it's really the, it's the shell. We should call it shell tech and not avocado tech. Yeah, honestly. Yeah. And especially like with the melons, like you don't want to just chop a, a melon in half and have all that flesh right on there. Like right. You, you mainly want the rind. It's, or you're going to have a mass of uh, sometimes even fungus gnats. And just like, <laughs> yeah. You're going to have fruit flies and fungus gnats. And, yeah. Yeah. and an anaerobic pocket, which is going to yeah. take time to and go you out. Can, and you can have that with avocado tech as well. Like avocado tech should be done when you're really trying to boost the worm population and really speed things up. Uh, but if the worms aren't there yet, uh, it's going to cause massive issues. And that's why we uh, always kind of teach about cutting an X into the avocado and popping it open like a baked potato uh, until okay. it's really popping off. Otherwise, when you cut it in half, it seems like you're creating more of those mites Um and if, it, if it's not alive and thriving, then you got the fungus gnats. Yeah, you got um, the, the, the worms aren't eating the food. They're eating the microbes. And, like, you need to break it down and, and increase the surface area and everything and, like, let them actually get in there to, to break things down faster. And, like, yeah, it's uh, definitely a good point. Like, you don't want and just, like, man. Do you feel like the fats are the reason why, after a while, it seems like all the worms get this nice, rich, dark purple? They have that biofilm that seems yeah. like... The, the springtails just naturally stick to and then like you guys had mentioned it seems like those those internet ways or we used to call them like fiber optic networks like going from yeah. dial up to that fiber optic network is, is a, a drastic difference it seems like when you understand worm farming definitely um so, so what do you think is the purpling from the fats is the purpling from the calcium what I'm not sure. I think it might just be a, a sign like that they're they're eating good, um, that they have the minerals that they need and everything. But as far as calcium, like that's one of the cool things about worms is like they're constantly calcifying everything that goes through them. Um, they're adding uh, calcium sulfate. Is it? It some I forget which form of calcium it is, but I think it's calcium carbonate. But I mean, one yeah, but uh they're they're adding calcium to everything that they poop out and so like obviously we know how important calcium is um, but yeah, yeah we don't add too many uh separate um, mineral amendments or anything like that like we've experimented with like top dressing kelp a little bit and like we experiment with 
like I know we talked about the Bokashi food scraps, but sometimes we'll actually toss some Bokashi brand down as well. Um, eggshells. Yeah. Eggshells are all gone through the the thermophilic process um, with everything, especially like uh, if you don't clean them off first. Um, like that could be breeding grounds for salmonella or whatever. I think, but uh, and pr my personal like grow and everything. Yeah, I, I toss some eggshells down there because honestly, I have a more problem running out of organic matter for the pill bugs than I do for <laughs> for the worms. You know, the, the worms, I, I never worry about them, really. Like, But uh, the pill bugs, you got to keep those fuckers fed or, uh, you know, you got to keep their population under control or they can really wreak some havoc. So, Yeah, same thing with the worms, let's be clear. You yeah. know, if, you, if you're, especially if a basement farmer or a tent farmer and you let the, the worms kind of take over a 30-gallon pot, uh, yeah, you're going to basically be growing in worm castings. And again, yeah. that's that's not good either. That's the thing, too, is like with these no-till pots, you know, that are cycle after cycle and they have healthy worm populations, it's like they're going to eat all that stuff. Like there's not going to be any rice hulls in there anymore. And like everything's going to turn into worm castings like you're talking about. So like that's why I really like like in between cycles, I'll top dress more aeration sources, you know, because like constantly throughout the cycle, we're defoliating our leaves we're chopping and dropping our cover mm -hmm. crop and like we're just creating more castings on top of the problem you know but like if you can toss in uh some biochar or some like long-term aeration that is going to you know settle down into it and then you toss more leaves on top of it it's like you're not just perpetuating that problem like you're you're adding a, a solution of, of more aeration uh as, as well so i don't know if any of you have ever done that like top dressed aeration and no, but I've heard of uh, people top dressing sand, and I think it's a good idea, especially okay. if it worms. But this yep. goes back to soil structure. Yeah, if your if your entire pot turns to worm castings, you've collapsed the soil structure, yeah. not allowing air to penetrate down in there. Um, you're yep. holding too much moisture. Now that goes back to that horizontal soil system by having that sand filter on the bottom. You're allowed to pull out excess moisture, and as the top dries out it naturally wicks that moisture back up again. So yep. you know, that's that another trick for, for the group. That's for sure. Yeah. No, I love that uh, horizons, but that's something, another benefit of the cover crop, I think is that wicking aspect, you know, it's like one, it prevents like the, uh, the channels for the water to actually penetrate down. But then two, it's like, if things were to dry up, that those roots would wick all that moisture back up. And like, we see that the cover crop really helps keep, uh, consistent moisture throughout the piles right and it doesn't let the, the surface go hydrophobic exactly that causes even more problems yeah you know, those kind of, you know, dude i can't believe you cover crop i'm just so happy i mean that's like you're the only person i've ever heard that, that the cover crops the the compost piles me too honestly I've, I've, I've had amazing results doing that just amazing results so you know big kudos for first awesome, that word. hell yeah appreciate that yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Good off again, Brian. Uh, my mic, I don't know, man. I get, the only way I know how to do it, boys, is to exit out and then come back and I plug in and then it works. Otherwise, I can't right hear on. anything you're saying. Um, but I did, when I pop back on, talk about cover crop. And I, I, I don't know how to say this other than probably sounding ridiculous, but that is got to be the extra secret sauce of once you start to understand teaming with microbes and yeah. Dr. Lane Ingham and all those extra things. It seems like vermicomposting with a cover crop using the, the chop and drop method, uh, in my opinion, adding all of the different decomposers so that you are closer to Mother Nature. The closer we can replicate, the better. The closer we can get to the old growth forest, the better. Uh, and, and in my opinion, again, getting the larger pot so that you have that larger stomach to work with. Yeah. Uh, that I feel like is really the next level of vermicomposting and, and taking it to the next level by using exudates and kind of getting deeper into that. I was hoping, especially with you, Leighton, since you worked at Rodell, and I feel like a lot of that stuff came out of there of, or at least from my knowledge, when I learned about exudates was coming from Rodell and from Dr. Elaine Ingham. Um, so maybe we could dive deeper onto what exudates are really doing to that soil system as well as just, it seems like improving everything um, on that cycle. It seemed like every kind of 90 days, it, in my opinion, it just really started to take off. And if you continue to chop and drop, you were amazed at how quickly they were breaking down all of that organic matter. Yeah, sure. Um, so I noticed in the chat, people are talking about, well, how do you turn your compost pile into your cover crop? Well, that's the whole point. You don't. 
This is for static files. So first you want to go through pathogen reduction, which means allow it heat up. Or, or if you're building a bio pile, then you don't go worry about thermophytes because you're not putting anything in there that could potentially have a pathogen. So in other words, it's, it's a vegan compost style. Um, it's what I often do is just, just plants only. Um, but anyway, so, so understanding that if you're, if you're building a pile and you're using cover crops as a method to hold moisture, prevent the soil, prevent the compost or the vermicompost from drying out in the sun, uh, getting penetrated by UVs, going hydrophobic, which means when you put water on it, it just runs right off. Now, the real secret sauce is the roots. If you can grow miles of roots through your compost or your vermicompost, every, uh, every component of that root is covered with what's called the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is where the magic is happening. So that's where your protozoa are growing out. That's where your nematodes are growing out. So backing it up and understanding prey predator theory. So if you have a food source, um, you're going to attract prey. You're going to attract deer. And the deer are going to come in and they're going to breed and they're going to get crazy and just have orgies and have tons and tons of kids. And now the mountain lions are going to come in. The bears are going to come in. And those represent the protozoa and the nematodes. So okay. you've, you've got to start by building those miles of rhizospheres so that you can bring in this predator prey process. And as a matter of fact, the more predators you get as they reduce the population of prey will go into what's called cyst form. So now they're basically little eggs ready to hatch when they're exposed to the right environment again. So you're really building this incredible long-term diversity um, and power within that pile by using those roots. Now, recently, we've come to understand that exudates are more than just a food source. Um, exudates can be a, an ion exchange. In other words, the plant can push out a magnesium and exchange it for a calcium. That's where it goes back into that. It's a carbon. Exudates are actually a carbon source. Um, and there's a new company in Maine. Shout out to Maine. I know there's a bunch of you guys up there. Um, that has just brought out a test where they can actually get so far as to identify XS exudates. So say the plant wants calcium and it squirts out this specific cookie or cake, you know, this, this molecule of sugar cocktail cocktail uh, that encourages the calcium uh, mining bacteria to go out and find it and make it release it plant available. So all of a sudden, the plant's squeezing this out and there's bacteria running out of the calcium source. So the bacteria start to die off um, and they, they release their pantry, their, their goodies that they've stored in their body as energy source to back to the plant. But now the plant's not getting the calcium that was being absorbed by those bacteria. And so all of a sudden, now there's an excess of this exudate in the soil um, that is kind of just hanging out there uh, again a long-term carbon source so that carbon will eventually get chewed up when another cycle happens whether it's a seasonal cycle or whether it's just a water was reintroduced and uh, perhaps washed in some calcium or whatever the scenario is because there's a billion of them mm -hmm. um, that exudate will then be absorbed by either another organism another biology or bacteria or or consumed when um, the calcium is reintroduced into the system again. So nothing goes to waste, but more importantly, understanding that the more plants you have on the soil, the more carbon you're storing, not only in roots, but in exudates as well and in biomass. So there's, there's a lot to, you know, really understand. That's awesome, man. Yeah. The, the, the surface of the earth is not supposed to be bare. No. It's supposed to be lush with plants constantly changing as the, cycles, po, as the seasons go on hang on what's yeah it's not a it's not drought that causes bare ground it's bare ground that causes drought i, I really like that quote yeah I th and i think for a lot of the newer um oh there's a question for you carbon to nitrogen ratio um so we like like six parts carbon 
to three parts nitrogen and then one part like a high nitrogen. And so uh, that, that's, I like the golden ratio there. Uh, what do you think, Leighton? So yeah, that's the, a three to one? Yeah, we pretty much. So we, we do uh, six parts carbon, three parts nitrogen, and then one part high nitrogen. So like so that, the two, little extra one, boost. Yeah, you're two to one but, to one. All right, with, with worms, that makes sense. Um, are you I, saying like alfalfa meal high nitrogen yeah that... so yeah alfalfa meal would be good um a lot of the time uh it's like this manure uh that's like mainly bedding uh that is like totally soaked with urine and so like that's going to be a lot higher nitrogen uh when it's like totally soaked like that now if that was straight compost and you definitely have issues you'd have to be turning that pile a lot yeah uh, maybe okay. that's maybe that's your thermophilic process yeah so and, okay. and that's the thing is like that that's the recipe that goes into the thermophilic process gotcha. and then from there it comes out and, and goes to the worms and everything so i do a yeah. static um so i'm more like three to one so it's 66 or uh 66 percent uh browns 33 percent green so that's yep. two to one um the guy i'm working with here uh in santa paula is a three to one so he's three browns to one green but as I said to him, I go, dude, you can't control that shit. I see how much crap's coming through here. Yeah, you, that's your target goal. But, you know, you've got to grind up whatever comes in that day. You can't push it off to the side. And okay, yeah. Thin. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of issues with, you know, like waste streams, whereas you're, you're in complete control of it. And because you have that aeration, yeah, you can go with a much higher nitrogen source yep. because you're controlling the, the, the temperature. Yeah, for sure. So that works. That works fine. And but for somebody who just wants to do a small scale at home composting, sixty six percent greens or browns, thirty three percent greens will, will generally never get you in trouble. And then if you do want to play with a little high nitrogen, I, I love your ten percent. I would never go over that. Um, but cool. then be prepared to turn it because yeah, that, it's going to heat up. Yeah, it's going to bump that heat up. And if you're That's trying true. to maintain biologics. Um, you don't want to go over 120 degrees. As soon as you go over 120, you are starting to lose your diversity. As a matter of fact, sure. even 110, 115, you're definitely affecting the diversity. Yeah, the worms don't like to be in that, you know, like That's, they'll like it around 90, or around the dude, highest. Yeah. Dude, That's a little lower than I had always thought too, Layton. So 120? I had always thought it was 130. So 120 you know, uh, or even. Yeah, 130 is when the thermophilic the thermophytes take over. So after 130, you're only going to be getting what are called thermophilic biology. Yeah. All right. Um, 120, you are going to start to lose the mesophilics completely. Um, and but what I found is the real sweet spot is 85 degrees, which is what you found out too. And if if I can maintain 85 in the right moisture level, every single amoeba that I yep. see under the microscope is kissing. It's really nice. not kissing. It's, it's separating. Yep. I, I imagine. It sounds like you created Miami or something. You know? <laughs> Southern California. Perfect condition, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> San yeah. Diego, of course everybody's having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> For real. <laughs> Damn. And that really is what you're trying to do. I, I hope people see that. I mean, every little pot that you have is going to be this little different utopia that you're trying to build, and there's going to be nuances in each one of them. Yeah. And the goal is obviously after hopefully a few months to a few years, uh, you're really happy with those results. And it depends on the size of the bin, obviously, the, the raised bed, that kind of stuff. But um, I w if you're really trying to do this, I would say the minimum that you would want to do, even if you're in an apartment, is probably 20, 25 gallon. Uh, if you if you really want to see the benefits of this, I don't see a lot of success with people that are using the the five gallon, seven gallon. A lot of them, even if they're just using the little red wigglers, tell me that they, I guess, can't keep up with it. And they come home one day and the red wigglers are everywhere on their kitchen floor or something like that. So I, I don't I don't want that to ever deter somebody from doing this because um it really is an easy fix to make sure that they never leave. And I know a lot of people will talk about how all the bugs and stuff. Uh, but again, as long as you, f from my knowledge, really don't do excess of uh, greens or excess of fruits and that kind of stuff, you're not going to have those issues as long as yeah, everything seems dialed one. in. Yeah. And, and the main thing is to not get fungus gnats because it seems like that's what starts to, especially if you're not, if you're new to this, uh, fungus gnats are the vector that just bring in a lot of different things that now you have to learn how to manage a variety of different pest issues. 
where if you're being proactive and really building this from day one, before you ever put a cannabis plant into the ground, you have your worm farm up and running, vermicompost ready to go. Uh, it's really going to minimize any kind of um, bullshit pest issues from the beginning. Uh, and another thing too, for like the small uh, worm bins, like don't just toss your, your food scraps right on top, like cover them a little bit with the, the substrate, whatever you have. And like, that's going to deter like the fruit flies and everything is if it's covered up. So. Yeah. And you're right about them being a vector. They, they really yeah. are. They're an indicator that you're out of balance. You probably have too much moisture. Um, something's going on. So right away, they're an indicator telling you that you've, you've got to be more aware you're doing something wrong, but also, yes, they can easily spread other problems, whether it's, you know, fungal or bacterial um, that will attack your plant. So you just got to be super careful about that. Now I've got a billion dollar question for you. Have you ever seen high pressure or low pressure affect your worms? No. All right. Pay attention to this one. All right. Uh, a buddy of mine who I brought up earlier, Richard, uh, yep. had an apartment in, uh, Pennsylvania, right down the street from Rodale. And, um, he would bring his worms from his home and uh, I think it was Black Bear or Big Bear, Pennsylvania, to the, his apartment because he had most of his worm bins back at his parents' house in, in oh. the basement and outside. Yeah. So he'd bring back, you know, bins for, you know, for doing different projects at Rodale. And this one day, um, a uh, supercell, a thunderstorm came in and we were at the farm and all of a sudden, you know, the lightning went off and the, you know, the, you know, the clouds were clapping thunder and it was got yeah. crazy. And Richard freaked the fuck out and ran, jumped in his car and peeled rubber out of there. And I was like, what the hell? What, what's, what is he afraid of the thunder and lightning? Yeah. Right? So he comes back like, you know, six hours later, it's dripping sweat, just like exhausted, panting. And I'm like, what the fuck was that all about, dude? He goes, you don't understand, man. My worms don't like the thunder or the lightning. I don't know what. But huh. he goes, by the time I got back, all of the worms were out of the bins and all over the apartment floor. Wow. <laughs> Dude, that is so wild. So I never hey, heard that before. Yeah, no. it, 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 he had pictures of it. It was crazy. It was fucking crazy. Damn. But that was that was a real eye opener that they too are are sensitive to yeah. high or low pressures or maybe huh. it's the static charge. Now we've right, all seen else. the the Godzilla movie where the guy's sticking the probes down in and, and yep. shocking the worms to get them to come up so he can collect them and measure the radioactive uh, need or measure the radioactive uh, inputs in them. Yep. Uh, so we do know that there is something to the electrical side of that. And I don't know if it was lightning related or high pressure or low pressure. Um, and nor did he, but just pay attention to that. See if yeah, for real. I definitely will. Super so interesting. Up, people, if you have your worms on the first floor during a thunderstorm, yeah. you might want to put them in the garage or the basement. <laughs> put a lid on there. Yeah. But, all right. I'm going to take a quick bathroom break if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Man. I'll be back real quick. Take your time, brother. And while he's doing that, in about uh, 10 minutes, I got to bring Valentina uh, to, uh, I would loosely call it soccer, but uh, <laughs> a bunch of three-year-olds <laughs> running around for 30 minutes. So, so we can keep going and I'll, I'll, I can control stuff from my phone, but uh, yeah, so anyway. So we be back in time to... Uh, close out at three or is that questionable you want to go to three well i'm sorry three hours because you you were at two hours 22 minutes yeah, yeah no i'm saying i i can do it from my phone oh okay you can do it remotely. i'll be yeah i'll be I'm like messing up again driving in the car i'll either be in the car driving or running around with a bunch of little kids uh i'll be like um like Kramer and that Seinfeld episode where he's like fighting all the little, like, <laughs> I'm going to dominate the kids on the soccer field. <laughs> so here's a question for you. Hey, Green, shout out, girl. Um, all right. Is it okay to have my compost pile raised a bit off the ground so I can collect underneath? Um, all right. So 
in in what? some of the best work that I've done in, in what I want to call low temp composting, I actually built uh, a Hugel style compost pile. So what I did was I laid down rotten logs um, and you want the old rotten ones because the ones that are kind of punky because they hold moisture and they've got a tremendous amount of saprophic, a sapro, saprobe fungi. In. And then I'd lay sticks down across the top of it to make a teepee. All right. And then on top of those sticks, brand new young twigs, I would lay down about three inches of hay or straw. Then I would build my compost top pile on top of it. The reason I did this was a couple fold. First of all, that would help to create a convection current. So pull the cool air underneath and allow the hot air to escape out of the top. And I also found that as that broke down and eventually collapsed in on itself, um, it created an amazing compost. So I wasn't collecting from the bottom. I was more kind of going about it in an aerodynamic or thermal dynamic um, approach to it. Um, but I don't see why you can't. But I think at the end of the day, the goal is kind of trying to connect your compost with the existing microorganisms in the soil that's underneath your compost. So that's part of uh, building IMO3 um, is building it on soil. So you're collecting the indigenous soil microbes as well. So depending on your goal, <laughs> Happy birthday, Uncle. I noticed you've adopted me as an uncle. No problem. <laughs> so it really depends on your goal. My gut feeling is uh, that you probably want to be collecting the, the material from the middle of the pile, not perhaps the bottom and not perhaps the top. Again, you know, like having that top cover crop is providing such an amazing benefit. But you can just dig a little hole you know, like push the cover crop off, dig a little hole, and then just start collecting from that area, um, not necessarily collecting from the bottom or the top. So I hope hopefully that long-winded answer uh, helped you. All right, welcome back, brother. Thank you. Was the question uh, where to choose like a sample out of your compost pile? Uh, no, it was. she wanted to know if she could build her compost pile off uh, the soil, like on pallets or something. Oh, okay, yeah, I see. Yeah, but I, let's talk a little bit about sampling because I think – you know, that's always been a, a big issue with people. They don't understand how to properly sample and or understanding that there's certain companies that do real compost, real compost testing. Composting yeah. testing is not the same as soil testing. They are much different. For sure. Um, yeah. So you, yeah, let's chop it up on that. Why don't you? I mean, honestly, that? like if we're talking about this stuff, I think you're going to be a lot more beneficial talking about that. I, I don't feel uh, maybe qualified enough. Uh, I, to talk about uh, all that sampling stuff. I'm sure I could learn a ton from you. Uh, so, all right, we'll, we'll go down that rabbit hole. So yeah. whenever you're sampling, like I get called into a job, uh, whether it's a composting facility or it's a field or a facility, it doesn't matter. What I want to do is get a the best representation that I can, yep. the conditions of where I'm at. So if I take a soil sample right here and I take another soil sample right over here, they're going to be a difference there. Believe totally. it or not, I don't care how close they are. You guys got to wrap your head around what's really going on there. It's not going to be uniform. So Especially even, in a modified growing medium. It's right? way, way different. Yeah. Or even soil because that yeah. soil, 90 or 80% of all soils are built through transportation, yep. wind or erosion. That's it. So no two places is the wind going to deposit the exact same particles, nor is the erosion going to deliver the same sand, silt, and clay. Yeah. So they're all going to be different. So the goal is really to try to get a best representation possible of the existing system, macro system. So if it was a compost sample, I'd take a, a little, little bits from all, all around the whole pile. You know, cool. Some I'm going to reach in, some I'm going to take from the surface, some I'm going to try to take from the bottom. Now, composting testing is completely different than soil testing. Soil testing, I'll do the same process, collecting the soil um, and mix them together and then make one super sample and then send that off. Same with compost. But in soil, you're doing soil chemistry and saturated paste test. 
in a compost, you're, 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 you're looking for maturity, C to N ratio, pH, which is similar to the soil. Um, and then there's a bunch of other ones, you know, Savita, which is the amount of ammonia gassing off. So it's a different animal. And, and I think most people don't understand that, that there are companies that do composting testing and then there's companies that do soil testing. Totally. Yeah. So that's, that's a and little, then the microbial yeah. part of it too. That's, that's not even talking about microbial testing. Yeah, it's a whole other test the microbial. Yeah. So that's soil food web. Uh, there's one in Oregon, there's one in New York and there's one in Connecticut. It's one in Australia, I believe, too. We've gone through um, Earthfort for the yeah. microbiology. They, they right. do a good job. Yeah, I've, I've been working with Matt uh, for a long time. And, you know, I, I think that, to be honest with you, um, microscopes are a wonderful tool to, to qualify something, right? To, to, just to look at it and say, okay, I see these guys. I know that I have a diversity, but when it comes to, to quantifying, to counting, like really I have X amount of bacteria to fungi, um, it's not the best tool. For um, sure. And an example, um, when I was studying microscopy down at Rodale, uh, Elaine had all these students that she had brought in from all over the country, you know, the brightest, youngest minds um, to be her protégés. And so I would notice that, you know, if, uh, if this girl had broken up with her boyfriend the night before, eh, she wasn't seeing as much good things as perhaps the day before when everything was great. Uh, I noticed Human that they over, they, they didn't see anything good. And, and trust me, because I, because I was the idiot, I was trying to learn. I was asking hard questions and whatever they looked at, I would look at it too. Yeah. You know, just to, just to understand what I was looking at, trying to sure. right. So I learned that huh. the emotions, the mood of the person, changed the results that they put down on that piece of paper. And from there, I uh, learned to meditate or to clear my mind before right. I go behind the microscope. Kind of like what you talked about, clearing yourself before you go in the room. You don't want to bring negative energy in right. there. You want to be, you know, in a, in a stasis with, with the environment and the plants. Fully involved so, with what you're doing. Yeah, right. Yeah. All totally connected with what you're doing. Yeah. So when I teach microscope classes, which I actually do quite a bit now, um, nice. that's one of the things I tell the people. I'm like, look, when once you get comfortable with learning how to use the tool, once we get through that and once you've learned how to identify the organisms, then one of the things we're going to really – dig down or drill down on is is clearing your mind and getting into the proper headspace don't use your microscope with a hangover don't yeah. use, don't use it if you're pissed off or angry or frustrated or or too high you're, you're, yeah. you're not going to get what you really need from the information that you're looking at so you know I, again i was so glad that you talked about clearing yourself and preparing yourself mentally before going in and dealing with your girls because you know, that is, it's so important. It's that energy, you know, it's Absolutely. That, that vibration. It's so important. Yeah. Energy exchange on every level, you know, all that stuff going on in the soils, energy exchange as well, you know, yeah. vibrational yeah. beings in a vibrational realm. You gotta oh, man. Oh, man. put More out more. a high frequency, man. <laughs> <laughs> Learn this, eat some mushrooms. <laughs> yes. Yes. Brian, you got anything to add to that, brother? No, I mean, uh, like I said, man, having Leighton on the show just kind of allows it to go on a whole nother level than uh, I feel like maybe even discussions that I have with other people. You know, we just aren't able to go on such a deep understanding. The main thing, I guess, Leighton, is I want the viewers to see that, like, Dr. Lane Ingham, yourself, other people have been talking about this for a long time. And I feel like it's just maybe been these last few years where it's the cannabis farmers that seem like they're out in front or certain some cannabis farmers are out in front being like, yes, this is or at least this is the, the lane that I want to be in. I want to drive down this main lane. Maybe I divert on some things, but I want to if especially in a larger facility, I want to hedge my bets on Mother Nature, not on the sole um, focus of like a team that's all synthetics. 
uh, like you had just mentioned, when people aren't vibing together, there's a friction. I've personally seen, especially in hydroponic systems uh, and as well as living um, soil systems, but it seems like there's just more, a lot more, if you will, ego in the synthetic world. They don't want to share things. Um, then there's, you know, maybe that assistant head grower that wants to understand some stuff. I've personally seen that as well, where it's like this person just wanted to learn more so that they themselves uh, could continue to to manage the facility as best they could, but that head head grower just didn't want to, you know, potentially, I guess, give him that road where they he could uh, one up him and maybe become the head grower because uh, the work work ethic was definitely uh, on the assistant head grower. And I feel like all of us little peons, trimmers, and water boys and stuff at the time, uh, we saw that. And um, it really is the living soil crowd that that I feel like is sharing a lot of this stuff. And so I hope that more of the synthetic world. Uh, if you guys want to want to chop it up or debate and that kind of stuff, a lot of those times we kind of give you guys those olive branches and they don't want to discuss that stuff because they don't want to talk about the way that they farm. They, they're happy with it. And I totally get that part, too. But I really like open discussion. I like open forums. I feel like if especially on educational side of things, um, when it's coming to Mother Nature, uh, what is the real harm in educating someone else so that their farm's a little bit better? If you're drastically higher on your cycles like the cantwells the steenslands you know yeah. uh, there's no way that the newer people are going to catch up with you and i feel like that's something that we need to continue to let people know that sharing this stuff and if you're dialed in uh, a lot of these people aren't even going to do this for another year or two uh that's something else that i feel like i've learned especially with doing more of the classes here in denver uh like in 2017 2018 everybody was gung-ho man and then you'd see him up at the next kind of meetup and you'd be like all right you got your worm bin yet are you are you warm oh i haven't had time to really get into any of that stuff yet and so um like you had mentioned chandler the other part of this is to just do it to get yeah. the experience and yes um you know there's issues but i don't want uh latent story to deter you from uh, the worms escaping all the time because that's what everybody <laughs> says. As soon so, as I start talking worm farming, they're like, "Yeah, but I don't want bugs and worms all over my house." That's <laughs> almost verbatim what they tell me. So I had that big old worm tower 360, I think it's called. Yep, you know, just yep. a, a stack of worm bins, and I put that inside of a, a cardboard box. You know, a bigger cardboard box. So like, if they did get out anywhere, they're, they're not going anywhere. Because it's right there, common you know. sense, man. Just use yeah. your common sense. For sure. Right? I feel like plastic also causes a lot more issues than if you're using. There's this thing called the worm in that you can kind of like put your scraps in at the top. The big bag like type little, thing. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's a better choice uh, if you're if you do have small space. Uh, but again, if if you're really trying to do this, you need a cover crop. You need a hundred gallon fabric pot. And my, again, my opinion, uh, I would do it with the lava rock at the bottom. So it just seems like it's. Uh, there to stay kind of thing and then you had mentioned the biochar that's almost uh, as far as i understand late and that's a forever carbon as well because i don't think that's going to truly break down in our lifetime adding that to our soil system so it's a you know a, a little a little sprinkle of that really goes a long way definitely yeah, yeah if you go over 20 percent um you will technically shut your soil down because the microbes are just hanging out on the carbon why would right. they interact with, with the plant or anything else they're they're yeah. happy just set up living their life on that little chunk so uh, i love this stuff uh, I, I i'm scared when i hear of large producers because the amount of co2 they're releasing to make it is you know it's kind of like trucking shit across the world uh, we need to be more localized and specialized and not centralized. But, yeah. you know, that's a whole other issue. But, you know, you know Brian, I, I think you're right in a lot of ways that cannabis has really taken the helm and charged ahead, uh, way ahead of, of all other types of growing. And, you know, it's, it's sad, but in the very first regenerative conference um, I did a talk at, that I co-hosted, I said to the crew or to the, to the crowd, I'm like, cannabis has the potential to be the vehicle to wake up big ag and to wake up everybody as to yeah. how best to grow it. You guys for years, I mean, you talked earlier about cooking soils, right? Well, the old timers in the seventies cooked their soil, but then they would add in compost teas and extracts to get the microbial life up. So they would supercharge this ionic, you know, using organic nutrients, breaking them down through the heat process, 
and then letting it chill out, putting it in their pots as a soilless medium, and then nuking it. Well, it would be a it would be a, considered a super soil at that point, but then nuking it with the biology and letting it go crazy. And they saw the incredible effects of this stuff. And then, of course, you know the camp and and the dark days of the war on drugs kicked in and the hippies had to come out of the forest and dig holes and you know put shipping containers underground and use diesel generators to grow them and they couldn't do the same things that they were doing outside so they were kind of led into that nutrient well how do, how can we make the nutrients easier for us to use and we don't have to wait and make these teas and that fueled that whole synthetic you know let's copy ag let's go let's go down the ag rabbit hole we all know where that rabbit hole went and is continuing to go. But no, I, I've, I've always believed that the cannabis industry, because they care about their plants, they love their plants, they want to give their plants the best, yeah. they will be the drivers that wake up the rest of the population as to what is the right way. And the scariest thing to this whole puzzle is that down here in SoCal, everybody's a salt farmer. And the weed sucks and everybody knows it and, and they laugh about it. And it's like, you guys are blowing shit tons of money in bottled newts. Yeah. And if you just put in a living soil system, your, your, your input costs would crash. You, you would be spending nothing. Your labor would go down. Your, your battles with, with pests would go way down but why won't you go down there? Why won't you try this? You know, even just dedicate a room, a corner, try it. I'll, I can prove to you how much better it is. But back whatever, up your mothers. Yeah, but for whatever reason, it rolls back to what Brian said. The head grower doesn't want to teach the little guy how to do it because he's fearful of losing his job. Yeah. And to be honest with you, that's because they're driven by ego because they're using these formulas that are mathematical or EC or pH. They're using these simple things that are like one plus one equals two where living soil people go, uh, anything can happen. Yeah. One plus one equals two. This is like, how cool, how far can I take this into a living ecosystem? It's yeah. not about me and my one plus one knowledge. It's about, holy fuck, man, I want more bugs. I want more worms. I want more biology. So we all work together in unison because we understand we don't know everything. We yeah. understand we're just starting this journey. We're, we're learning. Uh, we're not teaching or we're yeah. not directing or we're not controlling. We're learning. And that's the difference between that head grower who's controlling and, and the living soil crew who are all like, well, I tried this and it didn't work, or I tried this and it worked really well. And 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 again, I think you said it earlier best, Brian, is that you know you can get a gold nugget from all these different techniques and styles. You don't have to listen to everything they say. You don't have to drink the Kool-Aid and follow them and 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 do exactly the way they do it, but you can take certain stuff from all these different people. And, and make it your own. Try it. Try it. And, and maybe go back to them and say, hey, I did what you said to do. And I learned all of this. But then I tried adding this. And guess what? It made it even better. Now you're sharing back with them the things that they shared with you. That's the difference between the living soil crew or community versus the, the salt growers who have to control everything. You know, no, it makes a lot of sense for sure. Good point. I well, think so. sadly, a lot of the ones don't. It's, it's really kind of more the, a certain type of grower, but they don't even really understand the plant itself. They just they have somebody taught them their methods, like you had mentioned, and so they know certain brand names, and they don't want to reveal what brand name product they're using uh, because then they feel like that's going to create competition, or like you had said, maybe lose a job or something like that. And that's really the beauty of living soil is it's not like there's this one brand that that everybody has to use to be able to cultivate cannabis on that level. And it was the the old uh, ag companies, especially big ag companies, that seemed like they would create these little subsections for cannabis and they would give us these nice little booklets. And then it would say like week one, week two, week three. Oh, hey, now it's flower. Now we got to switch up all these different things. And that was something that when I was first getting into this, it seemed like, wow, okay, with a living soil system, it's just constantly improving. I don't 
I don't necessarily have to, you know, feed a specific thing in a living soil system on week two to be able to get to week three, week four, week five. As long as I just focus on improving the overall system, it takes care of itself. And that's what I still to this day, I don't feel like a lot of the newer cannabis farmers get um, with the living soil stuff. And, the, and maybe why they're hesitant to it is they just can't really comprehend if they've been kind of taught from more of the um, agricultural world of things. And that's kind of what, how they were first introduced into cannabis. It's hard for them to make the leap of you can reuse your soil and all that kind of stuff, because I feel like those guys are always harping about how great um um it's not carbon fiber what's the what's the stuff the the greenish stuff that always has algae on it that we use in hydro hydroponic farming hydrogen no it's the it's, it's the stuff it's spun with uh like oh my god i can't believe i can't think of this <laughs> it's like the the worst stuff to use um i'm sure somebody in the audience oh, might be able rock to... wool rock wool there we go uh, yeah, I feel like there's still to this day, I, I was um, talking to a few people that were talking about how there's still people coming into his uh, shop asking for rock wool and talking about like um, aqua flakes and, and things that I feel like, you know, it's almost like walking into a, like a maybe a Best Buy and asking them where the, the CD section is like nobody <laughs> does that anymore, man. <laughs> so education still needs to get out there i feel like regardless of where it's at there's still people here in colorado that are uh, in my opinion growing with 80s belief systems early 90s belief systems on like you know the hip-hop crowd was big into like oh it's hydro man this is and now i feel like it's kind of flipped uh living soil is more of that especially with the colors uh shout out to mountain organics i don't know if you guys saw he, he posted this photo like five years ago and it's like this pink purplish bud and i had never seen cannabis um that i felt like was real you know i felt like maybe i've seen pink cannabis especially then that might have been photoshopped because it just sure. looked it just had like this weird pink to it especially on like uh mass roots and some of these more like kind of i don't know just people on there weren't always being authentic i feel like where for instagram sure. people call you out for stuff immediately and and anyway so mountain organics post this photo probably like five six years ago um, and, and I feel like that's when it turned on to me is like, this guy is obviously on a whole nother level here if he's achieving these colors and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then he was honest to me when I was, you know, when I reached out to him, he's like, yeah, but it just doesn't smoke. And I feel like that's the, that's the conundrum for us that are really trying to move forward with this is finding the stuff that really sticks out so that people want to go out of their way to buy your cannabis. It's just gorgeous, has all the trichomes, everything that uh, a connoisseur would want, but then it punches you in the face. And it seems like uh, the, the colorful cannabis, the stuff that really is um, like, wow, when you're walking through uh, admiring somebody's work. Uh, it just doesn't have that punch. So if there's people out there that that understand genetics on a different level than us, I would love to know what kind of is sticking out for you guys uh, genetics wise that seems to have the color and the punch. Um, I think it was purple punch from from you boys out in California late and where everybody was uh, talking about that. And then it just never delivered. No, it had the never, purple, it but it didn't have punch. the punch. It yeah. didn't punch. That's for sure. <laughs> But, you know, let me let me just back it up a little bit uh, because you did you brought up a very good point, And that is that people have to understand in a living soil system that everything is already there and the plant is steering it, not you. So yeah. when the plant decides it wants more phosphate, it will grow out the phosphate solubilizing bacteria through its exudates. So it'll feed that population that population will expand and grow out consume the phosphate and release it back plant available through the nutrient cycling system or through the or through the um mycorrhizae if you're lucky enough to be in raised beds and have it and a horizontal soil system because if you don't have the sand silt and clay for the mycorrhizae to mine don't buy it you're throwing your money away so again, it's like letting go of control. And in a synthetic world, it's all about control. Where in living soils, it's letting go of control and letting the plant do the work and just making sure, being a steward of the plant. And I think that's, you know, that's a big problem for humans is to let go of control. We've all been programmed that we need to control our kids, control our parents, control our lovers or partners. And that's, that's the, the negative side of humanity. The other side is to love them, nourish them, let them make mistakes, let them grow, 
you know, don't hold them, don't stifle them. And so that's the big difference between those two growing methodologies is that one is control and the other is letting go of control, which is even scarier. <laughs> For real. That's another great point. I think a lot of it is like this regenerative and obviously we can't generalize it either group, but like we're focused on like things that are way over ourselves and our like profits and everything. Like we're regenerating soils for like future generations. And like, we're trying to like be self-sustainable from a system that, you know, like if you're reliant on feeding your plants from the bottles, like you're absolutely a slave to the system. But if you can create your own fertilizers, you know, like that is rebellion and like that is uh, self stability and, and all that stuff and so i think it's like a lot of us with this regenerative mindset it's like just so much bigger than just growing weed to make money and that's like a, uh, it's, a, it's a whole lifestyle you know <clears throat> it's More definitely about become a whole lifestyle you know like the brands like cookie brands and stuff where they can sell hoodies for 300 dollars and people grad gladly pay for it um, and the real, you know, behind the curtains thing is that cookies comes into places, cities, finds sometimes maybe even mom and pop shops, uh, networks with them and basically then takes, you know, kind of the the authenticity of that brand and then just puts the cookies brand over it. And so for a lot of you out there that are constantly talking about cookies, I wish that you knew that it's just white labeled bud in your city. It's just they came and they found out who some of the best growers are in that town. They struck deals with them and then they white label that shit. And I'm sure there's a bunch of other brands that do it as well, just not as successfully as them. Uh, so I, I encourage we've talked about this a few times late and where, you know, you, the community can speak with their dollars. And so if you guys are going out of your way to cultivate or you're going out of your way to make sure that you're you, choosing to buy cannabis that's grown organically, uh, especially if you view this as medicine, uh, I feel like the, the easiest analogy is that you would never buy sushi at the gas station at 7-Eleven, even though I see it there. Um, so yeah. there's just a, a lot of things I feel like paying for quality, understanding quality um, and, and feeling better. Because I know when I first was buying cannabis here in Colorado from a dispensary, all of a sudden I started getting headaches. And I imagine it was because they were spraying Eagle 20. Shit's fucked. Yeah. I there love that analogy. But don't buy sushi at the gas station. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I see it there, but who's it's the, the same with a, any quality product versus a bulk product? It's it's the craft versus bulk market. You know, it's like craft is always going to be, it's always going to speak for itself, and like you can't generalize anything. Like the nutrient density of the vegetables, or like the quality of ganja. It's like it all comes down to farming practices, and like especially like uh like it's not the cow it's the how like you know like that whole debate of the cows sequestering carbon or like you know the methane and stuff it's like yeah cows on a on a feedlot are going to produce methane but like cows on a, a pasture you know like it's it's going to outweigh because of how much like carbon they're sequestering and stuff it's like we can't generalize any of these uh techniques and i think i got a a bit of a tangent there i don't know <laughs> no i love it brother i love it and yeah i was on a on a uh conference call this morning i had to actually jump off of it um it was a really <clears throat> one on understanding um carbon in um urban and suburban uh systems and how the carbon that's being stored is being burned up at a rate of like one once a year it's it's so you have x amount of tons and it's gone in a year where in a natural system a forest it's going to be there for hundreds of years and it's all due to microbes heat lack of moisture um again this goes back to some of the early work i did on on engineered soils that if you're feeding an engineered soil um an ammoniacal form of nitrogen you're going to need more water and if you're feeding it a nitrite form of nitrogen, then you're going to need more carbon because it's going to use the carbon to break down that nitrogen to release it back to the plant. Mm -hmm. So it's you're going in a degrading downward spiral um, in these Plus, urban environments. Doesn't the plant uh, take nitrate nitrogen whether whether she should be or not? 
I mean, she, she right, loves it so that, much. So that's the fallacy. Like that is the foundation of the chemical industry is that the plant is eating it. It's not. The bacteria still has to break that shit down and make it plant available. And there will always be bacteria. And bacteria loves nitrogen because it's like friggin' McDonald's. It tastes great. It's easy to digest. It's cheap. And you can binge on it, right? You're not going to feel good the next day. But, hey, you know, uh, it tasted great, man. Fucking another pizza, another Big Mac. Bring it on, right? So bottom line is nitrogen will be broken down extremely quickly and easily by biology and released to the plant. But the nitrogen does not go into the plant without being digested by the bacteria first, by the biology. And she's still like, if, if there's enough in there, she's still breaking it down late, even late into flour. So it, is, is there some truth into that? Cause that was kind of like the old school way of like, Hey man, so you're killing been, your yields. There's been some incredible work that's been coming out of um, Michigan. Or is it Montana? Um, about the fact that there's so much nitrogen stored in the soil. There's already so much nitrogen in there that we don't need it. And, and same with phosphorus. There's so much of that already in the soils. We don't need any of it. But that doesn't help the chemical companies satisfy their stockholders and pay their presidents ridiculous amounts of money a year. So they're going to keep pushing. Oh, no, no, you need it. You need it. You need it. Uh, Kemp, uh, Gabe Brown, uh, Ray Archuleta have proven this over and over and over again. If you get the microbial biology, if you get the carbon or the um, soil organic matter up, you don't need any fertilizers and you don't need any pesticides because the plants are healthier. Yeah. So, you know, that's just the, again, that's charging through the gate and screaming in the desert. Like you don't need this shit. And people look at you like you're crazy. For real. You know, and it's the looks I've been getting my whole life. <laughs> no doubt. You get used to it. <laughs> you work where? Composting? What? Why would you work? Worms? What do you mean there's biology in the soil? What's fungi? I thought I eat those. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're approaching the three hour mark and we always like to give our, our audience questions uh, so they can oh, kind yeah. of pick your brain a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if Peter's there. He did say he had to, um, if he's driving, I guess maybe we would not be able to do, or I never, if you can, you can see the comments there Leighton. Maybe we could yeah. just do it that way. I lived off gas station. Chad, I'm with you, man. I traveled so much and fucking killed me. So I, I, real quick with that too. And shout out to Chad Westport. You crack me up every fucking time, man. You, we <laughs> appreciate you. Yeah. But I also uh, lived off horrible food. I lived off of basically um, like vending, vending machine food for many years when I lived in this apartment complex and I was doing well financially. I was playing poker for a living, but I had the worth health, health problems uh, probably still to this day. That's why I'm trying to get over that stuff. It was just maybe two to three years, but I feel like it's been a decade of trying to remember what what feeling good actually felt like because i feel like as you get older and you age you're kind of like oh you get used to this kind of stuff and for whatever reason man and i i always harp on this the autophagy and just all the things that are beneficial eating healthier you'll especially if you're over 30 years old i think or, or more you'll start to realize like wow i feeling good actually used to feel fantastic when i was 20 years old you know <laughs> I mean, getting older obviously is is a bitch, but there are certain ways that I feel like you can minimize that. And absolutely, uh, yeah. So a lot of that, like uh, like Chad's pointing out, that your diet is got to be a huge part of how you feel. And if you're constantly feeding yourself processed foods, mm -hmm. uh, and then you're asking yourself why you're in a shitty mood, uh, I feel like Layton is that one plus one is equaling two here, and you're just not seeing that the uh, things are adding up for you. Yeah, it's that preventative maintenance thing. Uh, if yeah, you're not making pop. time for for wellness, then later down the road you're gonna have to make time for for illness. I say that yep. right. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. So like, um, preventative maintenance across the board, and that's like why we put so much love and care into building our soils is because like, yeah, you, you spend a lot of money, you spend a lot of time or or energy creating the soil and making these huge beds the first time, 
and it's like uh, a spider weaving its web. It's putting in all that work, but like once it's set up, then you just get to sit back and wait for it all to happen. You know, it's like um, preventative maintenance with our bodies. It's like our our diet should be like definitely a a big focus and a, a big investment. And that's why it's like so important to grow our own crops other than ganja. You know, it's like we know how to grow uh, or we know how to make beautiful living soils. And so like, that's how you get nutrient dense crops. And like, I'm on, and it's so easy to grow them right next to them. For real. Right. Yeah. It's just more biomass, you know? Yep. And, and like the polyculture is the way to go. And like, why not have cover crops, you know, that give you uh, a harvest, another, another benefit or, you know, grow potatoes with your cannabis <laughs> plant. They and love each other. They absolutely love each other. Nice. I did some carrots underneath mine uh, this year. Good man. Outdoors, yeah. yeah. So going back to eating, I think, you know, that's again, another big problem is that we just don't have access to road food. Um, you know, when I was growing up, you, you pulled into a diner, you know, a we used to drive from Massachusetts to Maine every summer and, you know, we'd have a stop for lunch and, but you'd pull into the diner and it was real food. It wasn't this, manufactured food and so that was in the late 60s early 70s so think about how how much better that was than what it is today For um, real. you know those little diners don't exist and if they did they couldn't get the quality because of default like yeah. i traveled through greece and you know we were going from village to village to village um and the food was insane it was amazing. The taste, the flavor, it made me feel so good. Yeah. And I'm like, why? What's going on here? And they're like, well, we can't afford fertilizers or pesticides. So we have to live regeneratively. We have no choice. And so yeah. that's something that, you know, in many ways, uh, we Americans who have become the richest uh, civilization, perhaps, or we have the highest uh, standard of living. Um, have been shortchanged. We, we've been we've been ruined by the, the the money grab, the greed of the few who take away the good things um, and put in box stores. Like I remember hardware stores. Ace Hardware used to, there. Those used to be individually owned by families all across the country. Same with your grocery store. Same with your pharmacy. Yeah. Find me an old family pharmacy anywhere. Right. There's, they don't exist anymore. And the same with those small mom-pop uh, hardware stores. I actually did find one in Somis. And it was such a pleasure to go in there. I could get anything I wanted. And it wasn't this cheap fucking bolts that are made with pop metal. They're not even real metal. You know, they, they don't cross-thread. You know, I mean, it was it was such a pleasure. But it's 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 this is what's horrifying about being old as old as I am. is that I can look back and remember what it was like to to live back then my my dad worked my mom didn't uh we always had two cars there was never any complaints about you know not having enough money to 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 survive another day i mean you know yeah christmas wasn't like you know a thousand presents you know and we and most of them were clothes and stuff that we needed not just toys but it was just a different style a different world and now yeah. it's like you know both members of the family have to work. The kids get thrown in fucking daycare, you know, and, and all the food you eat is crap because the, 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 the goodness, the, the quality has been pushed out of business for the cheaper, faster, easier way and corporate profits. So, you know, this is, this is why I'm so dedicated to this show and Brian and doing this work is to get this information out to people so that they can understand there is a better way, but you have to put your fucking money where your mouth is or your belief system. Yeah. Don't buy the shit. Just don't buy it. You know, I, Brian talks about intermittent fasting. You know, I, I I'm all about it. Like I don't eat all day long and, and I'll try to eat something healthy around two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And I feel great. And then I'll eat a little something before bed, you know, an orange or an apple or something. Um, then fortunately, I am in a green belt here in Oxnard where there's a lot of organic, real food. Um, yes, you have to search it out. The farmers yeah. are great. Um, but, yeah, I can I can I can survive here. But 
back in Massachusetts, no. During the winter, you, you were you were forced to buy shit that was shipped in or trucked in from out here. Exactly. You know, and that's unfortunately the problem with the, the nation as a whole is that we don't have a real good network to get the organic food to everybody uh, yeah. throughout the course of the year. But sorry, that was a crazy rant for sure. <laughs> A lot of truth uh, if there. you guys have questions, uh, hit us up in the chat real quick. Um, otherwise, uh, we are at that three-hour mark. Yeah, definitely need to roll back into the gear here. Uh, so how, how would you start living soil on a fixed income? All right, so look at your resources. Where are you? Are you in the city or are you in the, in the country? Everything you can collect yourself. It's called wild crafting. Yeah. So learn a little bit more about sand soak clay and organic matter in your area uh, where's the sand pit um, walk the creeks walk the streams look for erosion erosion will give you sand soak and clay more often than not um, silt will puddle up you know at the base of the erosion uh, the clay will usually be a vein that you can see um, sand is everywhere um, as far as organic matter is concerned um, you know, resources like, you know, the hay feed stores, uh, you know, find out the farmers in the area, um, get hay, get leaves, you know, make your own compost um, out of the if you're trying to just start like right now. Well, that's the biggest problem you have. You need to yeah. prepare yourself, give yourself six months to collect everything, break it down and then build it. That's the other problem with humanity is we want it right. Now. We've lost the power of patience like we can't totally. wait for anything yeah totally yeah so hopefully i answered that question yeah never send organic matter off your property and we touched on this earlier about not sending away your leaves but like that stuff is gold and you should never send it off your property you need to stockpile that and it's all going to break down and be a, a wonderful resource someday and so like that's one of the benefits of having space and i know a lot of people don't have that so well, Jeff, but... thank you so much for <laughs> reminding me wilding wild crafting should be done with my with mindfulness and efficacy i call it respect respectfully wild crafting if you're going to go in the woods and get some forest stuff bring a if you're going to go and collect a five gallon bucket of it Bring a five-gallon bucket of compost or some other gift back in there. Never leave a scar. Don't dig yeah. a hole, strip it, and walk away. Make yeah. sure that you repair the forest floor so that it can naturally heal itself quickly and not scab up and or, or worse, erode. Absolutely. And we talked about this earlier, and Kelly taught me this from Dragonfly Earth Medicine, but, like, don't go out to the woods looking to wildcraft uh, silica, you know, or, like, you're going to look for horsetail and, like, you're so like isolationist mindset that you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going out and I'm looking for one single nutrient. Like I'm going to harvest silica right now. It's like, no, you're going to harvest whatever, she wh gives. whatever she gives you. But like, also you're going to hopefully walk out of the woods, you know, with this new wisdom that you you've learned something because you did sit down and you just sat in silence and you observed. And like, I, I think, uh, she could teach you a lot of lessons if you just go out there with like the most respect and uh, good intentions and everything. And you're not just taking stuff. Yeah, that is, that's, you know, that's so, again, such an important point is that if you are aware, if you're paying attention, the universe will show you what you need. Yeah. All of a sudden, like you said, if you just go in open-minded and don't go in on a mission, and just sit back and look. Then the things that come to you, the things that you observe are probably things that you need, kind of like intuition. Like every time I think of something like, oh, I should grab that pair of pliers. Not random thought. I'm going to a job. I should grab that pair of pliers. Every time I don't grab those pair of pliers, I get to the job and fucking something breaks. That's when you need them. Man, I should have listened to my thoughts. Like Your body is ahead of you. It's traveling in speed and time. And, and, that's where your intuition comes from. So if you are mindfully aware and you're walking through the forest, intuitively what you need or what you're going to need is going to come to you. Um, it's amazing when you let go of power and control. <laughs> and for real. And it's, it's truly remarkable how much I've noticed, you know, like 
that intuition, uh, like getting better and like being able to trust my gut, you know, that's my second brain, like Brian was talking about. And like, the more I, I eat these, these healthy foods and I inoculate my gut with these probiotics, it's like, that's where it's at. Like a healthy gut is a healthy life. Like a healthy gut is. It's is also everything. a healthy gut instinct, which is yeah. your intuition. It's everything, man. And if you have yeast overgrowth and you don't think that those microbes are affecting you late at night when you're craving candy and sugars and stuff, uh, rethink that. <laughs> I definitely used to experience that shit. Real quick, we have a question here for you, Chandler. Uh, yeah. If you ferment EM1 and molasses together in water, could you inoculate spent beer grain without the use of the specifically inoculated Bokashi brand? So EM1 and molasses makes bokashi brand um what's the question again uh it's brain grand I, you can kind of i think what he's trying to do is make his own bokashi yeah yeah that's what it sounded like yeah you can absolutely make your own bokashi um so you can buy a, a bottle of em1 or uh i think is it terraganics they have a probiotic or scd probiotics um there's a couple different brands out there but it's this consortium or, or mix of uh couple different lactic acid bacterium and uh and yeast and so like but okay so em is really cool and uh it's more than just like culturing lab from from my milk and, and rice wash water and everything it's like there's this really cool blend of um i, I don't know if i'm ready yeah. to get into all of this <laughs> there's this you know what? It's it's interesting because EM1 is basically um, three organisms that work together. It's a poop loop. They, they each one of them is producing something and taking something back away. Right. It's a really highly stable uh, biological community. It's very limited. Again, it's very small. You know, big shout out to Russ Brandon or Brandon Rust, I should say. Yeah. Um, he's doing some amazing work on advanced. He can't call me EMs anymore um but they're advanced communities that are working together um that are lab grown now i'm not a big fan of lab grown as i've made myself clear there's a big difference between in vivo yeah. and in vitro so in vitro is grown in a lab in vivo is grown in nature i'm all about the nature grown stuff because it's more resilient and it's proven to last whereas anything grown in a lab um is basically like taking the rich kid out of the big house and throwing him in the ghetto he's not going to last very long yeah uh, but vice versa, you take that ghetto kid, you throw him in <laughs> and give him all the freaking access to anything he needs. He's going to be really successful. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> That's great. And yeah, we talked about that with like the compost temperature earlier, like being Miami or whatever. It's like your, your soil temperature is like it's got its own unique ecosystem, too. And if you're brewing like a compost tea outside in the cold and then you take that and you employ that into your your 80 degree grow room, it's like those microbes aren't going to vibe. They're not going to, you know, it's like transportation, sending a, a human from Miami to Antarctica or, or vice versa, whatever, you know? Well said. Yeah. That that was one of the main things Dr. Lane Ingham, I felt like I took a gold nugget from her, was brewing when I started brewing my teas where I was growing instead yeah. of outside. Yep. It was cooler. Well definitely. said. Yeah, you, you definitely want to be at the same temperature gradient that you are applying it on. That's yep. really important. And watch out for high temperatures because they definitely i don't care how good of a, a start you had if you're brewing in temperatures above 100 degrees you're gonna have nothing but nightmares yeah for sure i think i saw one more question and then uh, from lex steinberg uh what do you think about using malted barley in your organic mix and or vermicompost i have heard it has an excellent source of enzymes and it does for sure yeah it definitely uh is active no doubt but uh so i've gotten some organic bags of malted barley right and josh and kelly saw that on my story and they reached out and they actually said that uh they've gotten multiple sources tested and it comes back for like a lot of pathogens um like from you know multiple sources and some of them are like even pretty nasty pathogens um and so that kind of deterred me a little bit. And I was like, well, I just bought two of these huge bags of it. Um, I think maybe I should just try to ferment it, like get uh, 
you know, put the EM through it to help compute any pathogens or anything like that. But I mean, honestly, I haven't, I've little experience with it, but they said basically they know people that have uh, used it indoors and run into mildew problems like powdery and downy mildew um, when you use malted barley indoors. And who knows, it's uh, something that I heard, you know, but it's, it's from Josh and Kelly, so I, I really trust them. But do you, either of you have any experience with that? We used to use malted barley, but we weren't being tested. And yeah. what you had just mentioned, I feel like, yeah, if you're being tested, uh, plus That's so much of this, the source is also, again, like you just, just literally mentioned is almost all of it. Right. So if you're sourcing quality products, um, yeah, I have heard that there is qual quality malted barley, but from what I understand, it's kind of like the baloney of the industry or whatever. It's all okay, the, yeah. the mishmash. Um, and that's why you have a, could potentially have a bunch of issues. I see. Yeah, it's like rice holes. Uh, yeah. the highest concentration of arsenic I've ever found. Yeah. And even in even in the organic version, there's still high arsenic. So I try I try to tell people if you're growing and you're getting tested, don't be screwing around with an aeration system, uh, uh, source like that. For sure. And again, go back to know your source. Know your source. And I mean know them. <laughs> don't just trust their word. Get in their head, follow up, check their practices. You know. Do your do your diligence. Yeah. Don't be lazy. All right, you ready to wind down, Brian? Yes, sir. I need to get my boys and uh, focus on some other things for sure. Brother, yes. it was so yeah. nice to meet you, man. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, appreciate your spirituality, your deep respect for both the environment and what you're doing. Man, keep up the good work, brother. I truly appreciate you guys. Hope to meet in person soon. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. yeah, DM me so we can get our contact straight. Now. Yeah, for sure, man. Talk off camera. Awesome. All, All right. right, take care, is, guys. Uh, is Peter there? Because he's gonna he's gonna have to be the one to click that button. Otherwise, well, we we're just gonna see him X stuck out. here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that would work. Well, if we just X out, people are gonna just watch black screen, an empty black yeah, screen. Yeah, they're gonna watch a, a blank screen for a little. While. Oh, there's Peter. Oh, there's Peter. Okay. Let me try to log and kill the live. Are you going to give us a three, two, one, Peter? <laughs> hey, we appreciate your time, Chandler. I mean, three hours of anybody's time is crazy. So, you know, each and every week, we just appreciate the guests. And you taking the time to kind of dive deep is is the main thing that I feel like our show is starting to be known for is uh, yeah. trying to find the real information.